All right, I think we can get started. Um, what I'll then just do is admit the people into the room as time goes. Um, can I just get a thumbs up uh, or a yes if you can hear me, just so that we can make sure that in as far as sound quality goes that we're good. I just need to know that you can all hear me. Just a thumbs up. Got it. Thank you so much, Johanna. But I'm released. Okay, so um, as time goes on, I'll just make sure that um, I admit the people into the room, which basically puts us at five minutes already over schedule because we want to make sure that we respect your time and um, that we get done as we had said. So we do have a program um, that is ultimately available. I'll just figure out where exactly to share that so that we all have um, access to it. But ultimately, just to get started, so my name is Mavis. Um, I am a Shivening Scholar for the year 2020-2021. Um, I'm working alongside um, six other scholars, so we're seven in total to bring this to you today, simply because we thought that it would be instrumental to not only share our application experiences, but to be able to really just um, have a, a true conversation about the difficulties that you'll probably face or might be facing already as we speak um, in, in, in just trying to get into a university. So with that said, we're going to get started. Um, the presenter that is going to be up first, her name is Bertha Tobias. She is from Namibia and she's currently um, studying um, in a US-based um, university, but she's currently presently physically in Namibia because of COVID, but um, she'll share all of that in as far as who she is. So Bertha, if you don't mind unmuting yourself so that you can get started, I really appreciate it. Right, right. Thank you, Mavis. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Bertha Tobias. I'm currently uh, studying international relations and economics at Claremont McKenna College in California. I recently graduated from the United World College of Changshi, China, which is one of 18 international schools all over the world um, that focuses on pre-university preparation. So I'm going to get right into it. Somebody says they can't hear me. Can you hear me now? Can you guys hear me? Well, I can hear you well. Um, anybody else just give us a thumbs up to make sure that you can hear Bertha, I'd appreciate that. Just all right. Um, in the in the mean, all right, so someone said they're hearing. Um, so in the meantime, it's very important to, I'm going to get into it. First of all, there's two main pieces of framework that are important when we're talking about US college applications, which is what is going to be my main focus. So firstly is the distinction between a college and a university within a US academic context. So a university is effectively one which offers a graduate and or master's program whereas the college is the one that offers an undergraduate program. So that means if I was going to Harvard, I'd be going to Harvard College and not Harvard University because I'm currently busy pursuing an undergraduate degree. So that's an important distinction that's usually overlooked. And then secondly, it's important to be able to distinguish between early decision applications and regular decision applications. Um, so this is now very US technical and US specific, obviously. So. Early decision applications, are your, you only get one early decision application, and that is an application which is basically your first choice school. But what that means practically is that you're going to have earlier deadlines for that school and you're going to have much earlier time, fr time frames. But it also means that that selection pool is smaller. So your early decision school will definitely need to be your first choice school, but that's all going to become clearer as we go along. So um, I'm not sure who's, who's busy with the slide, but if you could just share your, your screen, perhaps, Mavis, so that everybody can just see um, the slide that I, that I prepared. All right. Um, so firstly, the most important part of, and this is now getting into it, the most important part of the US college application is one, is the common application. So the common app is an application that basically gives you a, an overview of your application. Um, it is basically a summary and uh, what, and that's because the US college application process is very complex, there's lots of different components and the main and the fundamental starting point is the common app. So what you need to do very practically for that is go and search common app on the internet 
right, and start an account. And at the end, that's, it's basically going to serve as a checklist for all of the components of your college application. And then the second thing that's also important to look at is your application fees. So the application fees for me uh, were very scary because the U.S. college application for colleges or undergraduate institutions has an average fee of about 77 U.S. dollars, which is about 1,200 Namibian dollars, which is obviously a lot. So I applied to 10 U.S. colleges. So my application fees in total were about 560 USD, which in Namibian dollars is about 9,000 9, Namibian dollars. And that's obviously a lot. But what was helpful for me was looking for fee waivers. Um, so obviously that shouldn't be discouraging. All you need to do then in that case is reach out to the institution that you're applying to and to tell them that you are either unable to afford the application fees or that your family situation just doesn't allow you to pay application for all colleges that you're applying to. So I applied to all 10 schools basically for free because I was able to demonstrate a financial inability to pay $9,000 Namibian dollars in total for applications. And then the third, uh, and I'm not sure if it's showing on, on maybe the screen, but the third and the most important component is the standardized testing. It was also the most annoying part of US college applications. So perhaps the biggest standardized test is the SAT, um, which costs about 56 US dollars, and uh, in Namibian dollars, that's about 850 Namibian dollars. So the SAT comprises of two components. It's the English and the mathematics. In total, it's a score of about 1,600. Um, and obviously the perfect score would be 800 on both components. Um, and then it's important to recognize as well that different institutions not only place different levels of serious Okay, they don't, they not only place um, uh, different levels of seriousness on the SAT, but they also uh, effectively place different uh, minimum requirements or minimum SAT scores that are needed in order for you to be even considered for admission. For example, my school um, asked for an SAT score of about 1.5. So that's 1,560 1, for them to just consider me for admission. But what I did was I made sure to be in constant communication with the admissions office. I told them that I've never taken the SAT before and as such, I might not be able to reach that score because it is a, it is a serious test. Um, until I, I was able to prove to them that I would be able to demonstrate that I'm able to be part of their school community, maybe not necessarily through the SATs. And that, um, I say that just to prove that there is a little bit of flexibility depending on the amount of effort that you put into establishing individual relationships with the respective admissions officers of the schools that you're applying to. So that's the SAT. Um, the two other important standardized testing tests are the TOEFL, so that's the test of English as a foreign language, and the IELTS, so that's the International Eng English Language Testing System. Um, and those two are important, and you would need to give them your best, and those basically just test your ability to function in an English, uh, you know, English-focused academic environment. And... Um, so that's obviously for undergraduate, but once again, just speaking to the flexibility that can exist in different applications, um, I didn't take those because I was able to demonstrate that the Namibian education system, in fact, has prepared me properly to function in an academic environment. Sorry, Mavis, um, how much time do I have? I wasn't timing. Um, my entirely so I can't hear you. I'm saying I'm not entirely certain, but let's do two to three minutes more. Okay, cool. All right. So those are the, that's the standardized testing, SAT and your English language test. For graduate students or people who are looking to pursue master's degrees, once again, I'm an undergraduate student, so I'm not completely familiar, but it would be helpful to do research on your graduate record examinations, graduate management admission test, law school admission test, and medical college admission test, obviously depending on uh, what exactly it is you want to pursue. And then lastly, to use those two to three minutes, uh, back to the common app. The most important parts of the Common App, they're going to ask you for a personal information, your education, your activities, your test scores, but also your personal essays and your supplementary essays. Those are very important. So your personal essay is going to be about 600 words and it's just going to ask you, it's very open-ended. It's either about an experience or something that has shaped you, what is most sacred to you, tell us about your background. And that's really just the admissions office trying to get to know you. Your supplementary essays are a lot more specific to the schools and that's why you need to plan. So if you're applying to 10 schools, that means you're not only going to have one personal essay that goes to all 10 schools, you're also going to have at least 20 supplementary essays. In my case, it was, why do you want to attend Claremont McKenna College? And you know, tell us about intellectual curiosity. So sometimes those essays 
policies also include pillars that are important to the school's mission. They're going to ask you for a CSS profile, which is basically a record of your financial statements, um, you know, so that they can determine the aid that you need financially. You'll need recommendation letters from teachers, from a counselor, uh, and ideally from someone in an executive leadership position in your current institution, and obviously your transcript that needs to be sent directly to the college, um, and you need to have dis decent grades. The lastly, I'm, I'm 30 seconds, theoretical uh, advice. One, I think it's important to know yourself and to really know what it is you're looking for from an institution and what you're able to offer. So to be honest with yourself, in my case, CMC offered a curricular emphasis on public leadership, and I knew that's where I wanted to be, so that's where I set my heart on. Secondly, organize and plan your time. Applications take a lot of time. And lastly, and this actually is something that Mavis told me when I was busy with my application process, which is to give it your all. It's exhausting, but give it your best because in the end, it's absolutely worth it. So that's it from my side uh, until the Q&A. Sorry, we can't hear you, Mavis, sorry. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> okay, so thank you so much, Bertha. I'm trying to multitask at the same time to make sure that I can get the slides and simultaneously make sure that I, it's, it's, it's rough, nonetheless. Okay, so what Bertha meant by she'll be back for the Q&A is that we're gonna now have uh, Theopolina Kapani take over from her. And so they're sharing the slot of just talking on applications, both US and UK based. So currently, uh, Bertha shared um, how to apply to the US. So Theopo is now going to, Theopolina is now going to share how to apply to the UK. And then after that, they're going to do a combined Q&A together. That's Bertha and Theopolina. And they'll answer any questions that you have. So I encourage you to kindly um, just post any questions that you do have in the chat. Don't feel shy, just get active, tell us what you, because at the end of the day, this is entirely for you. This is to ensure that we answer the questions that you have. We have prepared content, but at the end of the day, I think what's most important, especially when you're in the application process, is being able to ask the questions in the areas in which you are struggling with. So with that, um, Teopo, if you are around, can you kindly just unmute yourself and you can get started. Hey, um, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Perfect. So I am Teopolina Kapani and I'm currently in the UK where I am pursuing postgraduate studies in um, infrastructure economics and project finance. So I'll basically share information about applications in Europe, um, basically continental Europe and the UK because the processes are quite different. Now, when I, when I refer to continental Europe, I'm talking about Germany, Switzerland, the Netherlands and so on. Um, so given that, the, um, Mavis, can you quickly go to the next slide, please? So um, given that the amount of um, time each application takes up um, is quite a lot, it's very important to think carefully about you know, where it is you really want to apply to. So there are a number of factors that affect that choice of uni that you would essentially apply to. So the one thing, the first thing that I usually look at is the academic reputation of the course, or better yet, the quality of the um, the course and the popularity of the course that you intend to apply to. Now, this does not exactly speak to the ranking of the university, right? Um, the ranking, yes, is quite important and it might impact your choice to a certain level, but it is more important to sort of find a university that has good standing in your area that you wish to pursue. And um, a quick example is like in continental Europe, we have what we call technical universities, right? And these universities are mainly well ranked and they specialize in technical courses, but they also have offerings in social sciences, in business and in art. Um, but I would say that if you're looking to explore a course in social sciences, you, would, um, you wouldn't necessarily have to go to these universities um, just because they are well ranked. It's more important to sort of find an institution that thrives in the area that you are interested in. And the next factor to look at is the length of study. Now, most universities in continental Europe offer a master's programs that span over two years. And then the, in the UK, a master's is usually just a year, right? And if we're talking about undergrad studies um, uh, in continental Europe, you're looking at anything between four to five years. And um, in the UK, it's only three years. So that's also an, imp an important factor to consider when picking what uni you want to go to. And the third um, factor is the medium of instruction. 
but so I believe that primary uh, the the primary preference for most applicants is basically to choose um, a uni where your um, course would be administered in English, and that's obviously very obvious with the UK. But with continental Europe, um, if you're looking at post grade level, at least ninety percent of the courses are offered in their local, um, you know languages so you would be required to sort of um, submit a proficiency um, sort of like knowledge on those uh, languages um, but um, postgrad at postgrad level you have a lot of courses that are offered in English but still they will still require you to submit um, information that proves that you have some set, uh, some knowledge um, on that particular on the local language right and the other factor that I would advise people look at is the geographical location and the social environment. Now, the key thing um, for an applicant to understand is the kind of educational environment that it that will sort of best suit how uh, they like to learn. Now, universities in um, different countries or even in the same country are very different in their styles and methods, right? So some are very focused on specific courses while others are more broad based in their offerings. And culture is also an important factor. You sort of want to find an environment that best matches um, the way that you like to learn. And this might um, sound, you know, less a factor compared to the others. But in my experience, I feel like it's quite imperative that beyond the academics, one actually considers the social um, environment because it does affect how you um, how you sort of perform in your academic work and how it is you generally show up in the world. And the last factor that I would advise you look at is the future expectation of your career. Now, this sort of speaks to the point that I made about um, what is this? It was about the academic quality of your uh, chosen course, and it is probably one of the most um, important factors for me particularly because a longer longer term um, sort of employment and earnings um, earning prospects should be considered when choosing um, between different universities so just sum it, uh, summing summing everything up um, it is important to sort of focus on the institution as opposed to focusing on the country and secondly it's important to focus on the academic quality of the course as opposed to focusing on university rankings and um, but also the one thing that I would mention is um, looking at the host country's immigration policies is also quite important, particularly if you're looking to sort of if you're planning on working that in that country after your studies. And a disclaimer, I'm not encouraging any brain drain here. I'm just saying that keep all your options open and all these things obviously do affect where it is you essentially end up. So um, so once you've uh, weighed out all these options and carefully made your decision, um, obviously you now need to lodge an application. And there are a couple of items that you need to submit um, to different universities. The first thing is the academic um, writing submissions, I believe. And these come in a form of, um, you know, personal statements. If you're looking to apply for doctoral studies, we're talking about um, research proposals or academic essays, um, or even um, essays on a given subject. You know, it differs from program to program. So it's imperative that you do look at the program that you're applying to and see what it is they require. And when it comes to personal statements, I always say that two thirds of the personal statement should um, be about the course that you're applying to. When it is you became interested in this course, um, you know, are there any aspects of your current studies that relate to the course and uh, that you've chosen? Mm -hmm. And also, what have you learned about the subject that has inspired you to take it to university level? And the other thing that you should include in, the, uh, in that, that part of the statement is that what are your personal qualities uh, that you possess? What are the personal, uh, what are the qualities that you possess that make you uh, suited for this particular area of study? And the one third of the personal study, uh, um, of the personal statement should then be um, looking at, um, should then you, it should be focused on you as a person, right? Um, it should be about 
this opportunity uh, to say what 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 sets you apart as a person from the rest of the candidates that are applying for the uh, for the same cause and it also it doesn't make sense to sort of make a long list of everything that you have done select two things that stand out and elaborate and expound on those and also the other thing that you submit are recommendation letters. Now, when we're looking at postdoctoral studies, you are required to submit at least three of them. And undergrad, uh, wait, for postgrad level masters, you're only required to submit for most universities too. And that is both in the UK and um, in continental Europe. And the other thing that you need to submit is obviously your academic records, right? And it's, um, uh, it's basically just a, a complete official bachelor's, um, um, you know, transcript if you're looking at applying for postgraduate studies and for doctoral studies, we're looking at both bachelor's and um, master's. And um, for continental Europe universities or universities in continental Europe, it is a must to submit your CV. In the UK, it's quite different. It differs um, from university to university. So ensure that you've looked at the formats of, because uh, different universities put up uh, the formats that they would like their CVs to be in. So ensure that you've looked up those formats and you sort of alter your CV to fit the, to reflect those formats formats when submitting these. And um, like I said previously, um, proof of proficiency uh, in a foreign language or in the English language is quite imperative when submitting these applications. Again, local um, in continental Europe, you are required to know the language. In the UK, it's obviously in English. Um, so you have to also submit TOEFL test or any other test that the university requires. Um, and then um, in continental Europe, when you're applying for um, you know, uh, courses that are in the economics or the business department, you are required to submit standard scores. This can be the GRE school or the GMAT school, particularly when you're applying for MBA programs. Um, it is um, like this is not even something that you can do away with. You have to sit for a GMAT or a GRE. They are compulsory across Europe, right? Particularly if you're pursuing full-time MBA studies. And I think the most important thing that sets the two regions apart, now the continental Europe and the UK is the tuition. Um, paying for tuition um, is a foreign concept in continental Europe because most countries have a minimal or close to no fees. Um, in Germany, uh, for example, all international students pay the same rates as home students, which is about 300 euros per semester, and which makes it, um, I think if you convert it, it's, we're looking at about 600, uh, sorry, 6,000 million dollars, excluding living costs. It's just for the semester. And I think that is close to nothing when you're comparing it to the UK, because in the UK, international students pay quite a bit. Um, yeah, right. So um, just to sort of wrap this up, um, I sort of wanted to point out a few mistakes or common mistakes that we make when we submit up our applications. Please, 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 first of all, always ensure that you've provided sufficient information about your previous qualifications. Um, if needed, um, submit an overview of the credit uh, of all the credits that you have uh, obtained. And it um, that sort of makes the job of an admissions offers easier um, if, you, if they have all the information in one place. And the other thing is in case, you, um, in the case of those applying with qualifications from overseas, please do not attempt to translate um, your, your qualifications into another system. It is always better to state the original name of your qualification and especially with credit conversion. Um, in Europe, they have what they call the ECTS system, right? And, and in the case of Namibia and South Africa, we have, we work with the NQF level credits. Do not convert those into their um, ECTS system. Submit them, they will do the conversions themselves unless otherwise, um, you know, they request for that. And even when they do, approach professional bodies to do those conversions for you, for you and even to translate your um, academic transcripts and all of that good stuff. So don't do it yourself. And that's just, yeah, that's about it from me. All right, thank you so much, uh, Theo. For, so for those that are wondering how come she knows so much with the ranging from economics to engineering all the way uh, to an MBA, it's because she currently holds two master's uh, degrees after having done her undergraduate um, in civil engineering. So then she did an MBA and then she did another master's in, in engineering and now she's currently doing her PhD. So she's really the best person to speak to in terms of whichever level of study 
um, you're looking at. And so in, in as far as Bertha is concerned, I'd like you to also unmute yourself now, Bertha, because um, we're going to go into the Q&A session. What this basically means is I'm going to read out some of the questions that we have. Some people submitted their questions prior to the webinar. So I'm going to start with that one because it does relate to um, applications. So you and Theophore are welcome to share the answering as per how you, it suits you. So the first question is, am I required to re-register to the university or since you have already attained the previous requirements, um, what is required? I think this is probably speaking to if I've applied to a university before and maybe I got a rejection later, will I have to apply again? Um, yes, you'd have to apply again, but I think the question is not very clear. If you've applied to the program and you've gotten in and you didn't pursue your studies because of, you know, circumstantial, I don't know, whatever the case may be, um, you are allowed to request for a deferral. Most universities approve deferrals and you will not have to reapply again for the same course. But in the event that you have been rejected, you will have to reapply. Okay, thank you. The second question is someone, uh, so La Tifa says, someone recently shared with me that the quality of education in regards to masters and above in the UK is not as good um, uh, quality as continental Europe or the States. Would you please comment on this? Beth, on me. <laughs> Once again, I think because this is masters, I think Tiop is the best person to answer this. Yeah, it, it does okay. masters, okay. Um, so I've studied, I've, I've studied in continental Europe, right? I've done my master's there. Now I'm doing postgraduate studies in the UK. To comment on the uh, quality of education, I think, like I said, if the first thing you should consider is look at the academic um, standing of the course that you're uh, looking to pursue. Um, yes, Europe particularly is very, very good with um, technical courses. They are really good, but that doesn't mean that they don't have courses that are as good in social sciences or the art or in business, right? Um, I think the important thing is look at the course, you're, uh, look at the area you're looking to, uh, to sort of explore. And based on that, look at the university that is that thrives in that area. I think both countries are good. It just really depends at what area it is you're looking to pursue. Thank you. Second question is, considering that our school curriculum in Namibia is Cambridge based, does the UK consider this when it comes to the aspect of the English test? This is a vinyl asking. No, nope. you would have to sit for the uh, English language exams, be it the TOEFL or whatever. They don't, they don't look at it. And very yeah, well, well, yeah. And to add on to that, in the US, they do look at that. Oh. So. But yeah, so because, it, for example, I didn't have to write the TOEFL or the IELTS. Um, I communicated to my school that, that we are Cambridge um, and they waived that. So in the U.S., they look at that with undergraduate admissions. Okay. Um, and then somebody's asking, for, for medical schools, I've been searching for schools which offer clinical masters both in the U.S. or Europe. Any help on navigating to such schools? Medical schools? No, I don't think it's specific to medical because Tiofo, you were speaking about how you have to basically look up which is the best university to go to in relation to the field that you want. So I think it's equally um, as applicable in this case, no? Right, correct. Um, and yeah, and that's what I said as well is to, to know exactly what it is you're looking for. And I think that's a good starting point, which is to look for medical schools. If you're fresh out of high school, then you can't go into medical school directly because in the US, you'd have to go to college first before you can specialize. Uh, but I'm not sure what it's like in the UK. Um, if, you, if you're looking to go to medical school in the UK or even in continental Europe, you can have direct entry from you know, our system back home from our high school system, you can have direct entry, but also just look up, um, look up their, uh, the specific requirements for all the universities that you're looking to um, get entry into. Okay. Um, the next question is from Latifa. She says, what are some of the countries you advise for someone to pursue a master's degree with a possibility of a PhD and would like to live or work there for a period of time? You know, who, you know who's in this um, chat who would be great for that? Uh, Memory. Memory is actually here. And she um, studied medicine in both Cuba as well as Poland. So she, if Memory, you'd like to speak, that'd be great. Um, and she's done. And she actually also is currently working in Poland. Um, but Bertha and Theopo, any thoughts on that? 
Yeah, I think in terms of working, and this is something that I just recently discovered as well, I definitely advise the U.S., obviously. Um, and that's uh, primarily because I've learned that the U.S., obviously, depending on the type of institution that you go to, but generally has very good professional support systems in place, which connect you properly to internships. And many times when you do well in those internships, they do offer you full-time jobs. Um, in fact, I know somebody who's a Namibian who worked, who did his internship while he was in college. He did his internship at, a, at an investment banking firm in London. And they recently uh, offered him a full-time offer. Same thing with another, uh, you know, student who is Namibian, who's currently going to start working full-time in the U.S. So I think because of that professional support that exists, it definitely helps you penetrate uh, meaningful professional opportunities. So I would I'd highly advise the U.S. if you want to work somewhere after you've studied there. I think the other country, I, I haven't studied there, but I've heard a lot of good things about uh, Canada. They have a very uh, good policy uh, for immigrants. They work on a point-based system. So if, if, you can, if you are able to prove that you've sort of like um, satisfied all the required points, you, you will be able to sort of settle there. They have really good immigration laws there. And the other countries, also Germany, you're able to really just get a job um, after studying and also pursue postgraduate studies or go to PhD level. It's not that hard. It's doable. Okay, but people, girl. <laughs> um, yeah, but I, I guess you're speaking from experience, given the fact that you straight out of your undergraduate, no, master's was it, you were yeah. able to get a job because you did an internship there. So I think back to what Bertha said, is that if you do then sort of like pursue internships during that period, chances are very high or likely that you might get an, um, a job offer. And also, I think it's quite important to mention the fact that you need to be proactive. You can't just sit around and be like, oh, no, I've completed this. Where can I get a job? Like, before you even complete your studies, four months before that, try to send out emails, reach out to different companies and request for internships, request for jobs, right? And they will, you, will, you will land a job. Okay. I'm not encouraging brain drain, please. I'm just saying. The next uh, question is, does it affect my admission if the master's degree I am applying for is not exactly the same as my undergraduate qualification? And this no. is from Eileen. No, I mean, to be fair, I have gone from civil engineering to infrastructure economics, which are two totally, they're not that related. So you are, the UK is a very good place for this. I think Mavis, you, you've experienced this. They are, they, they do allow you to go into fields that you know, you have no knowledge about because they will teach you these things. It's quite flexible. If you have quant skills, you are able to penetrate the financial um, sector or the finance courses. It just really depends. You will, you don't have to have skills a, an undergrad in um, whatever subject that you're looking to pursue. Okay. Yeah, and I can see that it's the exact same for the US as well. It's just a matter of, I think, what you demonstrate academically that you're capable of, then that is the merit that they use. So whether you've done your undergraduate in economics and you now want to pursue your graduate in like clinical science or clinical psychology or whatever, depending on if you, if you pass the standardized testing and you demonstrate that you're able to, I don't think that should count against you. In fact, um, I believe the US academic model highly encourages that kind of diversification. Okay. Um, let me just get to the next question. Um, please elaborate more on the test one has to do for business economic courses that you just mentioned. I think that might have been you, Tiopo. Oh, so basically, these are there are two tests, right? It's either you take you don't have to do both of them. It's the GRE and the GMAT. Um, now, these are required for economics, business, MBAs and even highly technical courses. The LSE requires them for all, well, almost all of their postgraduate courses. And um, it is just really um, a standardized test. Um, they, it can, you have to cover three sections in this test. It's the quant sections, the quantitative section, the verbal section, and um, the oral section. So yeah, it's just to prove that you're able to, uh, you, have, um, the, the, you have the skills that they require. Um, irrespective of, of the country, it's it's basic. Like it, it, it's taken in all the countries. If you're looking to penetrate, if you're looking to do an MBA, um, an economics degree, or a business degree. All right, and then so I'm just looking at the time. We've got 
two minutes. Wait, let me just double check. We've got two minutes, I believe. Um, so, so the next question is about language proficiency. And I think we've covered that. Um, and basically the answer was just that depending which university you go to, their language requirements are different. The next question is, um, is there a recording for these uh, to share with participants. I just sent a link to the slides that you're currently looking at in as far as the recording. I will look if I can put that up online. Uh, can you share tips for scholarships? That's the next segment. Does applying for early decision increase chances for admission in the UK? I think it depends on the courses you apply to. Some courses wait, uh, they have, some courses have like a rolling system. They send out admissions as, uh, as the applications come out. But some courses like the MBAs, they wait until the deadline's over and then they assist the applications and then choose their uh, suitable candidates. So it just really depends on the course you're applying to. Certainly. Okay, the next question is, I'm just trying to get like as many in, minute, in the one minute we have. If you get accepted to a university in the UK, US, will your grade 11 academic report? Bertha, this one's for you. Report um, academic report whilst you're busy with your matric year. Is it advisory to go without having an NSSCO university? If the university is oh. best, will you be able to get a job in Namibia without your NSSC? I know nothing about that, Bertha, you're up. Right. Yeah, definitely. I think that's very relevant. Um, it definitely depends on the qualification that you have from high school. So, for example, I don't have an NSSC, but I do have an IB, which is a better equivalent of the NSSC. But it's not advisable to leave university without anything um, and just go to university. So I think if you have the option, if you're doing a bridging course that's going to give you some equivalent of, a, of an entry level qualification, then definitely. But straight out of grade 11 without anything to fall back on, I would not advise that. Okay. I think before Bertha goes, can you quickly elaborate on the IB? Because I do right. know that it can be taken in Namibia, so people can just have insights right. about it. Right. So very quickly, the IB is the International Baccalaureate. I believe one of the schools that offers it here is Windhoek International. So it's basically like the NSSC of the world. It is accredited and it is um, recognized strongly by any and all post-secondary institutions all over the world. So it's like A-levels almost, sort of. Uh, A-levels, IB, same WhatsApp group. But the point is, it's a post-secondary qualification that gives you access into any university, obviously depending on how well you do. <laughs> Okay, so one last question, and we're actually good on time. If you guys can answer this in a minute, um, we actually got through all the questions. I'm so glad. Uh, th there's another one about scholarships, but we're doing that in the next segment. So don't worry about scholarships. We're going to cover them. Um, the question is, I've done undergraduate medicine. I need a master's now, though. My university master's four years. Okay. Then if you want to specialize, you need extra years. I have heard some schools combine master's. And oh, it's a medical student and speciality. So it, what I was asking on medical schools, postgraduate, not undergraduate. Oh, she's talking about specializing. If you have finished your um your you, like medicine, like you're a doctor, and now you want to go and go specialize. I mean, you're probably able to speak on this because you've got a friend that has been specializing in medicine currently. Correct. Um. So here's the thing with medical programs. It's very they are very diverse and very different. It's, it's a very difficult system. Um, but I know um, in, in South Africa, particularly, at post-grad level, you'll have to spend four years specializing. Now in the UK, it's standard. For masters, it's one year. Um, in, in continental Europe, again, it's two years, even if you're specializing after your post-grad. So it just really depends on where it is you're going. Um, okay. In that case, I really would like to encourage memory. If you are here and you'd like to just give some advice on medicine, particularly if you're listening and you'd like to share on it and maybe just give a bit of insight because she is um, just finishing up her, her medical degree. But in as far as Theopo and Berta are concerned, thank you so much. You guys are like, you, you guys have got so much knowledge. I want to bottle it and like sell it. Like, <laughs> but honestly, it's been great. And I love the fact that we were able to combine US as well as UK and not just focus on one or the other continent, just so that there's an overall understanding. And I also like that we did touch on SA universities, because at the end of the day, those are important too. But thank you for your time. We made it two minutes over, but two minutes is chilled because we can live with it. Uh, but yeah, Tiopo, good luck. Uh, Bertha, if you're going to stick around, please feel free to just chat to the people in the chat. Um, meaning that for those that would like to ask some more questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat and then Bertha will stick around to answer some of those. But in as far as Tiopo is concerned, you are free to go. 
Okay, so memory, okay, bye, Theopo. So memory is willing to ask, answer some of the medical questions. She is here, she's in the chat. So feel free to just post the question again and uh, maybe she can answer any questions that you have in relation to medicine. So next up um, on our agenda so that we can um, get into this is uh, Martha. So Martha Abner is a Shivening Scholar with myself for the year 2020, uh, 2021. She's currently studying at Lancaster University. So Martha, kindly unmute yourself so that we know that you're here um, and then we can chat to you. So I just need Martha to unmute herself. So that I have. Can you hear me? Yes, I love the representation. You got a Namibian flag and you've got like, yes, I love it. I love it. So Martha, please, uh, you can take over. Okay, um, thank you so much, uh, Mavis. And to the participants that are on here, so good morning. Yes, it's still morning this side. I started applying for scholarships uh, two years ago. Sorry, let me just put on my recording. Two years ago, and I only got my I only got a scholarship in my second year of application. And I honestly believe the thing that gave me a competitive advantage was because I learned how to write or to portray or sell my story to the panelists. Now, there's a lot of ways you can do it. I'm not saying this is the only way you can do it, but what I'm saying is that these are the tools that have helped me significantly and have landed me a scholarship. Uh, number one, when it comes to scholarships, there is, I, I'm only familiar with the Fulbright Scholarship, the Chivning Scholarship, and the Commonwealth Scholarship. I applied for those three scholarships, and I only managed to get interviews to Chivning and Fulbright, but not the Commonwealth. But Commonwealth was in my first year when I didn't know how to write, for this, um, if, if that makes sense. Now, when it comes to... To, to, to scholarships, when you go to, let me say, when you're applying to, let me say, UK-based universities, that's, there are some universities that have their own scholarship programs in, in place. Like, let me say, the London School of Economics, you can apply and they will assess you based on merit and also your personal uh, statement that you have written, and they can give you like a full funded scholarship. And there are so many of those in the universities, uh, in many of the universities. So it is advisable when you are choosing a, a university, you look at what are the funding options if they have a scholarship, and then you also apply to their scholarship. So in case the other scholarships do not work out. I'll be emphasizing on the, on the, on the achieving scholarship. And yeah, that's because obviously that's the one I got. But what is very important to, to remember is that 90% of the scholarships out there will require you to demonstrate something, to demonstrate how it is that, um, that what it is that you have done if they are going to spend or invest money in you. And that is the, that is what I want to allude to. Maybe, maybe we can move on. So, when it comes to demonstrating, let me say, what are your leadership skills, why it is that we need to invest this amount of money in you, what it, what it is that we will, um, how can we prove that you have really, you are really the one person that we are supposed to be investing in, um, to be investing money in, I normally use a star approach. The star approach is just to give you a competitive edge because many of us struggle with structure. Not all of us know how to sell our story in a coherent and clear manner, but if you use the STAR approach, even if you have not done much, you are able to, the, the, the person that is reading your, your, uh, your, your scholarship is able to have a, uh, an idea of what is really, what do you really want to say? So first, before I get into the STAR approach, it is very important to read about the scholarship you want to apply. Because if you read about the scholarship you want to apply, you would know, okay, these people are coming from and uh, they are looking for people, let me say they are looking for leaders. So you have to put a lot of emphasis on how you have demonstrated leadership. If they are looking for social community or social activities, then you now need to see what are, have been my social activities and how can I portray it in this, um, in this scholarship. So the scholarships, the funding bodies will really differ. And that is why it is important that you have to read up on it and see, okay, if this is their aim or the core of this scholarship, how can I best uh, sell myself as far as this is concerned? Yes, now for Chivning, there's a lot of leadership examples that we have experienced or all of you guys have experienced, but what is important is to choose the one that will sell a common theme in all your stories. Like, if I'm going to talk about um, 
leadership in the workplace because I'm uh, in my career plan. I want to end up, let me say, as a manager. Then it is better to sell your story to tell a story in such a way that, yeah, this is how I have grown over the years and this is how I've demonstrated leadership. And this is why I want to end up as a, a manager in a specific position. So it's just to say that by the time that someone is reading your story, they must just have that one common theme. I must not be confused that, oh, okay, uh, maybe it's like, uh, what is it, climate change. And then here, when you come here, she's like, oh, she's also uh, interested in this when it comes to network. But then when it comes to the career plan, then it's something off. Because then there is no coherency or let me say there's no theme in all your four essays. It's a thing of you have done so much, but you have done everything. So it is important to really identify what are those um, activities or things that you have done in your life that will help me and sell my best story. So the STAR approach, it, I have put on the slides what it means, what it is that you are looking for. So when you say your situation, yes, we have had a lot of situations in our life. And also some of us struggle with writing like myself. I would struggle with writing because I'll be putting the whole situation about how this and this happened and then this, but that is not necessary. You just look at the situation and say, okay, this situation was maybe because we were challenged or the, the company was experiencing a lot of challenges in terms of uh, what is it, poor attendees or my, my, my society couldn't generate the funds or something that is already like in itself it, it already paints a picture because that is like your situation and you just need to make it as attractive as possible and then it will go to the task and then when it says task yes sometimes in, in, in your situation you are required to do something so write that what it is that they required from you what they expected from you or you can basically just say uh my challenge was that i wanted to sensitize on uh, gender-based violence that is basically your task and then your action. I would like to spend a lot of time on action because we struggle with action. Like, what has been your action? Yes, I went and then I decided to bring three people together. No, just use, go and Google if you need to on doing words in terms of action and use words like, yes, we collaborated, I initiated, and it's a thing of I inspired, I clarified. It's words that, that really triggers the next person that is reading your essay to say, oh, this person did this, they established, oh, they developed this. Now you go there, you are, you are using, yes, your English that you are used to, but the other person is reading 1,000 applications in, all, um, in, in two days or three days, and you, you must really be able to point to this person, what was your action? So it is really important that I would advise you, honestly, is just to go there and Google action words, look at your situation and see what it is that you did and put it under the umbrella of those things. And the one that is also very important is the result. Please do not demonstrate anything where you do not share the result. The, 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 the applicant does not worry about you having, um, having uh, pulled a lot of uh, people, or let me say, having used your social media to, to pull up a session uh, of this magnitude if there is no results. What was the result of this? Yes, we managed to, to get 300 participants get on this and, and to influence them in what. So it is really just how you write. It is very important to, see, to, to remember that your competitive advantage, unfortunately, because these people do not know you, will be on how it is that you are going to write. And yes, so basically that is just what I want to say is, uh, in terms of demonstrating. If you are demonstrating your network history, you are demonstrating your leadership skills, use the star approach what was your situation what was your task action and the result it is very important that you put down the result of your outcome um next so my struggle in my application has always been the career plan and all the scholarship applications will ask you so what is your plan and I would be there, yes, I want to, yes, I want to start my own company. And, you know, it, it, it's just, I was just over uh, everywhere and anywhere and seeing all these many things. So I'll be writing, yes, I want to start a, a company. And then I want to also be in education and be a lecturer. And then after that, I also just want to help and mobilize, uh, uh, let me say, help the, the, the people from my community in terms of, but it is like, it's so many things. And it is not clear, there's no clear or co coherent plan in terms of what it is that I want. Until I came across the SMART approach. Now the SMART approach is really just to say that, yes, your, your, your career plan must be 
specific. When we are saying it's specific, it's a thing of not I want to be in, I want to end up in marketing. That is not specific. But if you tell us, I want to uh, end up as a marketing director at uh, Namport, it is very specific. Even the person that is, uh, is reading, they're like, oh, this is what you want to do. And then the measurable, obviously measurable, I'll never write it down in my essays, but I'll, I'll keep it just so I can see how, how will I be able to measure my, my, my progress. And the moment you identify your specific goal, you are also able to know what are the skills or what is your gap in terms of getting to that marketing position. Because when you do that, I need to actually have a master's. And that is why it's easier for you to sell your story in terms of your career plan. Relevant. Relevant is just to say that you need to explain why is your, why is your, your goal important. How, what does it tie? Like in terms of the... When it comes to, I always say that when you, are, when you are doing something, explain it in such a way that every other person must understand. I remember when I was explaining my, my career plan or what it, why it is that I wanted to study this, I spoke on, I've always seen companies, let me say like Namdeb. I've always seen Namdeb um, doing really well. They are the, the, I've always seen that people that work for Namdeb appear to be very happy. They... The, it's, a, it's a country that is in the south of Namibia, but people in the northern region always could attribute, or when they saw Namdev, they were always like, oh my goodness, Namdev, you work for Namdev? And I was like, why is it that they could have so much influence? They were in the south, but their influence was in the north. What, what was that that made them so uh, influential as a company? It is a simple goal, but to me, it like even to the panel, it was... Something that they are like, yes, because it's a thing of, it's something that is clear, everyone can understand it. So, and that is how I managed to use my, what it is that I wanted to do to explain my career plan, because I just said, I wanted, I have seen this, and this is how I, I want to be able to get into that gap and also create something for myself. But by just taking something very simple, so you don't need to make it very complicated. It must be, if you want to end hunger, Explain why you want to end hunger or something, but it must be something very social, very, very common, and very everyone that is coming there must understand what is really happening here. Time bound. With time bound, what I did is that, oh, is that I took my three essays and put them, my immediate, my uh, midterm, and my long term. Because in your third and your final essay of evening, they really just want to know what is your plan, and the the best way to do it is really just to divide it in three and say. Make it realistic and say, if I come back, I just want to do this. Obviously, if I have gained all this knowledge and skills, I'll be able to get into my midterm and finally, I'll, this is how I end up to my final goal. So inherently, it's just to say, your career plan must be, very, must be smart and use this approach to mark, to tick off your, your boxes. It has helped me and I hope it will also help you. And the final one is the, oh yes, what is also important with, when you are talking about relevance, is actually just how does it benefit Namibia as a whole, especially if you are taking it from a perspective of a developmental uh, scholarship. They need to know how does this benefit them. And if they are in, like, if it's the UK, they want to know how does your career plan even fit into what it is that they are doing, because then it's easier for them to grant you the scholarship. Okay. Amazing. I love that you were so relatable in your examples and the fact that you brought it down to a level because I understand that even when I was applying initially, you know, it just it felt like these essays are asking so much of me, but I love your, 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 your star approach. I love the fact that you're basically showing that it has to be measurable. It has to be specific. It has to be attainable because if you're going to give examples, they need to tie together so that it makes sense because sometimes we just write to write. We almost fill the page with what have I done? And there's no coherence. There's no, you know, it's just all over the place. So really just showing that even an essay should be structured because I mean, we understand introduction, body and conclusion, but it's almost like when we apply to scholarships, we forget these basic, um, you know, essay rules. But nonetheless, thank you, Martha. So we're going to go into the Q&A session. You are literally three minutes on time. Um, your Q&A session is intended to start at 12, but uh, we've got three minutes to spare. So uh, just to go to the questions. Um, so to get straight into the questions for the scholarship segment. Um, okay, so here we start. 
Okay, can you please repeat the three scholarships? You mentioned three that you applied to. Okay, I applied to Commonwealth, Fulbright, and the Chivning Scholarship. And I only managed to get to the interview of the Chivning and the Fulbright. <laughs> <laughs> I can actually relate. I also got to Fulbright and they didn't take me. I was so gutted. I was like, Timmy, brah, really? <laughs> okay, so then um, somebody else also asked that you repeat the scholarships. But what I did do while you were speaking is I just went to go and go find um, some, I went to go and go find some links and then I put them in the chat um, then somebody was asking about the medical conversation so memory I see that you are busy having that conversation in the chat that's fine and then that's still medical reprieve okay so then please explain more on measurable and attainable okay um, in terms of measurable it's just basically asking yourself how will I measure my progress as far as my uh, specific goal is concerned? Yeah. So it, I used the, in my, in my uh, scholarship when I was doing this, I, was, I, I, I did the time bound. The time bound helped me to know that this is how I measure, to say that if I come back from the UK and this is the first thing I do, I'll be able to measure that. The second thing is to move into here and then I'll be able to measure that. Attainable is just to say, do I have the skills and resources for it? Like my goal, do I have those skills and do I have the resources for it? Now, if you want to end up, let me say, as a director in a company, you already know you have done your research and you know that, okay, you must have at least an MBA, you must understand this specific knowledge. Then already you know that I don't have that, how do I get there? And that's how it is easier to also explain in your, in your I think it's your third essay of Chivning, to say that this is my current gap. Like to get to where it is, actually, this is my gap. And that is really what most of them really look for. Okay. Um, okay, so then there's a very good question and I get this a lot. Um, Marano is asking, is it possible to submit my chevening application before completing the three university applications listed on my chevening application? Oh, sorry, so she's asking if she can submit her scholarship application before applying to the universities that she has, she has intended to apply. Yeah, like, yeah. So it's, it's basically the question of, can I submit the application before the, the school applications have been done? Okay. Honestly, that is also what I did. In both my two times when I applied for uh, Chivning, I first always just applied for Chivning and then later I will concentrate on my school application. But I would like to advise you to say, apply to your, to your universities if you can. Because the challenge always came in with me is by the time I need to get to the interview, two of those universities have probably did not accept me or, you know, it's just that thing of, oh my word, I based all my essays on this. Now the, the universities are showing flames. They don't want me. I need to find another university. <laughs> I think it's flexible. <laughs> they, are, they are really flexible. You can come into the interview and then explain. And yeah, they, you can explain, you can change another university at your interview stage. But it's just to say that to help you to be very clear and to also just be focused, rather apply and then you know these are the universities I'm set out to. And then it's also just easier to explain your story. But yes, Chivning, uh, you can apply to the Chivning application because it's like due on the 3rd of November. So invest most of your time there and then you can move on to your, your universities. And I just, I want to add on to that, the, the fact that, so here's something that they don't tell you, and this is literally like exclusive information. The universities that you list, uh, Martha, where'd you go? The universities, no, I'm here. <laughs> the universities that you list on your, on your application, you must get into one of those because you can't go and go decide later, oh, what I meant was Oxford, oh, what I meant was Lancaster. You actually have to make sure that you can get into one of those three universities. And the reason why it's so important for you to do your applications ASAP is if you get to the interview stage, you are allowed to change. Um, maybe say you, you have those three that you listed. You, you have to get into those. But if they all reject or decline, then you can apply to others. But at the interview stage, you must then tell them that these are the universities I got into. Because if you don't, then it's, it's going to be too late for you to add. Because um, once the information goes to the secretariat here in the UK, you can no longer change your university options. And this is something I didn't know. I was just lucky in that one of the, because I, I had like 
I had all these dreams and I was like, I want to get into Oxford and Cambridge. And then the third um, on my list was Sussex. But I, d- I did want to get into Sussex. But the point of the matter is, you know, it is very difficult to get into Oxford. It is very difficult to get into Cambridge. So you have to be realistic in that you can have like your aim high and shoot for the stars. But then you must also have a university that you know for certain you can get in and you, you do want to go to. Otherwise, you, you stand the risk of not being able to change your university option. And that's very important just that's one of the things i wanted to add so back to you martha um the next question is in the case of chevening course selection does one have to apply for courses from chevening partner universities or all available courses that appear in the search okay so what happens is that it is preferred that you apply to the partner um, partner universities when you get there but Chevening will fund you if you make a very strong case. They will not um, dismiss you because it's not a partner university. It is just preferable. Like, it is better if you get to your partner university. What, what should, in fact, what you should do is get, have at least a partner university in your three choices. If you know that all oh, my other two choices are not, and then you at least know, oh, okay, I have this option. But they really will not dismiss you because I'm thinking when I first applied, most of my universities were not partner universities. So it, it does not really have an influence. The only problem is when it comes to, let me say, when you, 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 what is it? When it's time to get to the university, the university needs to contribute a specific percentage. I think it's 20 something percent or something like that. No, I'm not sure it's about 20, the percentage. It's 20. Okay, so they need to contribute a specific percentage. And if they do not want, because most of the partners don't have a problem contributing. But if that university does not want, then you'll be forced to move on to your next uh, course. Oh, you are forced to pay. And I'm yes. telling you, it's a hefty amount. You're looking at like 80,000 type vibes, so don't do it. <laughs> but no, Martha, you are right. But it's just um, the partner universities are just a safer option. So I, I don't necessarily recommend that you go outside of that, especially given the fact that it is so expensive. Like if you do the conversion from Namibian dollars or the, to, to British pounds, or I don't know which um, currency that you operate in from your home country, but it's just such a steep amount that I would, just to be on the safer side, stick to rather um, uh, choosing from the partner universities because they're all good universities and most of the best universities in the UK are partner universities. So to steer from that will just be like, why? Like you're just giving yourself admin. Okay, um, wait, I actually had another question on my phone. We've got about two or three more minutes. Um, let me just get it. So the question was, here it is, um, how and what is the easiest way to obtain a scholarship, as in most cases, a university application and scholarship periods are not directly proportional to one another? What is the, sorry, um, repeat the question. The question is, what is the easiest way to obtain a scholarship? Because sometimes the scholarship and the university applications are not aligned. I assume that's what you're saying. Uh, okay. like the, no, the easiest oh, okay. no the easiest way to obtain a scholarship is just to apply before the deadline there's really <laughs> no special <laughs> no special thing out there you just need to look at when is the deadline of the scholarship and i need to apply before that uh deadline it does not really have an influence on anything or maybe i'm not I, that's how i understand. well yeah no you're right you're 100 percent right i think one of the things that i did is because i was applying for a scholarship for three years and what I used to do is I used to put these in my calendar because I'd always like open the Canon Collins and it just closed like seven days ago. You're like, ah, oh, dang it. Because I'm sure you can, many of you can relate. You're like the application, you come to the website, it closed like a month ago. So what I would do is I would put it in my calendar for the following year. I'd look at the opening and closing times and I'll put like four reminders for the following consecutive year so that I don't forget that I'll just be like, Shevening might be open, Shevening might be open. And then I'll, the, the, the reminder on my phone would remind me because the other thing is there's so many scholarships and they all open at random times. So it's very difficult to be able to keep up. So the best thing to do is if you, for example, um, know, sorry, let me just make sure this person asked. Um, so there's somebody who's sharing a video. Stop video. Um, just make sure that your video is off, please. So what was I saying? Oh, I got distracted. Okay, uh, Mimis, I see, um, I see a question here where they're asking, can you please shed some light on the networking essay? 
Yeah, I will be covering some of those types of things because I'm covering basically what to put in your application in as far as brand and portfolio. So, but you're welcome to also give your input. Go ahead. Oh, okay. So what I wanted to say in terms of networking, networking is the most cumbersome, I think, on the achieving application, especially if you have not really, you don't really understand the essence of networking. So the first thing is just to understand really what is networking, like, yeah, what is networking? So what I asked myself is, Whenever I ever use networking to actually bring about change or sensitize on something, you know, that's what I asked myself when I was doing my essays. And it was easier for me to remember that, okay, I also, fortunately, I was part of like a Toastmasters club that avails so many opportunities, like a lot of people from diverse uh, backgrounds and environments that I got into contact with. And I had been able to tap into my network to bring a result of something in my workplace. So it was a thing of I needed to. I, I identified that there was a challenge in terms of mental health at my, at my workplace and I managed to get into my network of people that I know there to come in and do a talk or a, uh, do, do a session on mental health, like to share their experience, those ones that I've been able to get into contact with, to share their experience as far as mental health is concerned. And obviously this resulted in... Um, people being sensitized as far as the cause is concerned. And also it brought about a partnership between my company and Toastmasters. So it was a thing of, you really now need to think and say, okay, when have I really been able to use networking to bring about something? And yes, if you have not done anything of that sort, start, start thinking, how can I really uh, build a network so that I can bring about, you know, something. So basically when, they, when what Chivning is looking at, they are really looking at how have you utilized your network uh, to bring about something because they are saying, I'm putting you, I'm giving you over 50,000 alumni, so, like a network, there's so, so many people that you'll meet uh, that, that are at your disposal at, in, that are, that are Chivners, yeah. that have done amazing things in their countries. So they want to know that when you come to the UK, you, you are able to reach out to these people so you can influence uh, things in your country. That is what they are saying. I think that is, that is so fundamental. I think that point alone covers networking as a whole. Like that, that right there, that's it. So really like listen to Martha, like she's, she's speaking truth. Okay, so what's going to happen now is we're going to take a mini 10-minute uh, break. But before we do that, Martha, I just wanted to say, can you kindly stick around just for like 10 minutes or so just to answer some questions in the chat so that if anybody has any additional questions, even just one that I see here, somebody's asking for your email address, then, um, yeah, so Martha will take over in the chat for now. But Martha, thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here. I know that things have been crazy and super busy for you, but you made it and you... Uh, made the time to be here and I think I really I can't thank you enough. No, thank you, Mavis. So what, and thank you, know, everyone. Good luck with your scholarship applications, everyone. You will get it. You must believe in yourself, eh? <laughs> that's that's fundamental. First you have to believe in yourself. But Martha, thank you. <laughs> Please stick around. Okay, I'm quickly gonna ask everyone to mute themselves because I feel like this sounds coming through, but I'm not sure from where. Um, yeah, so I'm going to play you guys some music. Um, you are welcome to go and go take a 10-minute break. And so you have to be back. Um, let me just check the time. You have to be back here by 20 minutes past what, um, well, I don't know what time zones are. You must be back in 10 minutes. So whatever time it is by you, it's, it's 10 minutes past whatever the time is. Come back at 20 minutes past. So go get yourself some coffee. Go get yourself some water. Just walk around a little bit so that you don't get brain dead because at the end of the day, a brain can only focus for an hour at a time. So we'll be back in just a little bit for now. I will play out some music, okay? Um, I'm playing you guys a song that ha was getting me through the morning today because I was, I don't know if you guys are Christian, whether you believe in God, Allah, whichever it is, the universe, is, it's fine. But I was basically just, you know, praying over you because I know what it feels like to be in that position. I was there for three years. And so I, I absolutely understand the feeling like you just, you're, you're pushing against the door and it just doesn't feel like it's opening. So this is a song that was um, on my heart this morning. So I'm going to play it. And then I'm just going to try to do it.
All right. Okay, so um, <clears throat> you come back now. I hope you got yourself some water, some snacks. Um, so I'll give you guys another break in um, a little bit. So just um, let me see if I can share the program. Um, let's see, find out if I can. Just so that you see what is happening and how it's happening. Okay. Well, there's the program just so that you can follow along and see what exactly. Um, so that's far we have covered applications to the US, applications to the UK. We've covered scholarships. Um, I do hope Martha stuck around because I, I saw that somebody asked for her email address. So depending if she says yes, I'll certainly be able to share that. Um, it's just um, obviously at the end of the day, it can get a bit, you know, a bit taxing just to sort of like be able to cater to everybody. So the reason we decided to do this uh, webinar was just to be able to answer collective questions. So this is more a Q&A than it is an info session simply because um, your questions are really what's important. But we did thought, uh, think to come with content already because maybe it answers a broad set of questions. But if you have specific questions, um, Isaac, I'm not sure why you... Angela. Wait. I'm saying just make sure that you switch off your mic because in the event that you you don't, I'll have to remove you for the, from the room just to make sure that we can guard against, um, you know. Okay, so let me see what's the time. And it's 20 past. Let's get straight into it. Um, I'm just, uh, just make sure that you mute yourself when you come into the room. Make sure that your video is not showing so that we can just um, make sure that... Um, we're together so i can get started then yay did everybody get water give me a thumbs up if you got water give me a thumbs up if you got snacks give me a thumbs up if um you're ready to go okay so this is the second part of uh, the seminar uh i won't be able to look at the questions while i'm presenting because i also have to um, admit people into the room as i'm speaking but i'll try to uh, pay close enough and take attention. So my name is Mavis. Um, I'm a Shivening Scholar and I'm currently presently um, in Sussex or uh, well, Brighton. I'm in Brighton. It's basically south of London and in the in the university called the University of Sussex. So um, I want to just give you a, a brief analogy and overview of my story simply because I think that, you know, people do find themselves um, you know, in a position where they're just so frustrated at uh, the different things that are happening in their lives. And okay, let me just mute it. Okay. okay, so the alternative, if I can't mute you, just hold on. I can't mute this person. I'm not sure why. That's weird. Okay, try again. Okay, there we are. So, um, so just to share a bit of my story so that if you do find yourself in a position or just where you're a bit under, um, underwhelmed by how things are going or maybe even overwhelmed by it because you just feel like you've been pushing through a door and you're just not sure how to get to the other side. I applied um, to Chevening for three consecutive years. Admittedly, like, um, you know, Martha had shared, shared the first year my essays weren't great because I kind of also did it in a rush. I did it like two days before the time. And it's just not advisable to um, do that simply because it's, it's, it's rigorous. You have to put in the time and they can actually tell because anybody can tell when your essays have been well written when you, whether you put in the time or whichever so the same goes with you know just making sure that um you set yourself up such that everything that you do the people can see that you actually truly want this and that you're sure about what it is that you want so in my first year of applying my essays were not great um i did it in a hurry but then the second year around i really put in the effort um the only thing is that what had happened was i used an email address 
that is my secondary email address and I hadn't realized it. So eventually I did get to the interview stage, but I never saw the email. So then I tried again this year, but admittedly when I applied, well, last year, when I applied for this year's um, scholarship, I really was at a place where I was very, very tired. I was almost beaten down and I was just like three years of applying because remember for every time I've had to apply to Chevening, I've also had to apply to universities and you can imagine how tiring that can get. And so lucky enough, I was able to sort of master up the courage and apply a third time. And I guess they say three times a charm. But really what I want to encourage you with today, maybe leave with you is if you can't fly, then run. And if you can't run, then walk. And if you can't walk, then you just crawl. But whatever you do, you've got to keep moving. So you can't give up on yourself. You can't give up on your dreams. You can't get to a place where you're so, uh, you know, where you allow life's um, rejections and no's to sort of become what you clothe yourself in and get to a place where you no longer want to move forward. So um, to just get straight into the presentation. So my part of the presentation is talking about your portfolio. The reason your portfolio is such an important part of this is because you're going to have to relate to the people who are reading your, your scholarship application or your school applications, who you are. This comes with a personal statement or even just the letters that you have to, um, the, the different four essays that you have to write in as far as Chevening is concerned. And that really requires you to be able to sell yourself. Like, and when I say sell yourself, I mean like you have to be able to put on paper, who are you? Why is it that you do the things that you do? Um, and how is this relevant to the the scholarship okay so um for starters in order to have a professional portfolio you must understand uh um, what is it that you bring to the table everybody has strengths everybody has the things that they're great at and you have to be able to play on those strengths and the reason this is so important is because you have to show how do you depict leadership and leadership doesn't have to be being at the forefront of an organization it could be leading a team of volunteers it could be uh volunteering somewhere and being the person to lead the team to do that stuff it could be really leadership sees itself in our everyday life you just have to be looking right so you have to play on your skill set and make sure that the people who are reading your application are actually hearing the things that you do so in my case i'm a doer so i'm the type of person where if i if i see a gap i'm gonna fill it if i see that you know people are applying and everyone's asking the same questions i'm gonna get up and we're gonna have a, a webinar if i see that my community is struggling and i i live in 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 a place where you know there's such a large um poverty and um, gap between the rich and the poor, I'm going to see how can I play an active role in actually ensuring that there's something that I do in relation to that. If I'm at church and, um, you know, people are walking in, I'm going to go act as the usher. It's just one of those things where you have to set yourself up so that you can just play on the skills that you do have. If you're a people's person and you find yourself being the one that has to constantly advise your friends, play on that. But in essence, look at your life the things that you do and class them. Because sometimes we do depict leadership, but when we're asked to write an essay on where have we depicted leadership skills, we, all, we draw a blank because we think leadership is the CEO, leadership is the person that founded the organization. No, leadership finds itself in the nitty gritty details of who you are, right? So then when we talk about networking and, and um, you know, creating relationships, because you also have to be able to, to, to show what would you do with a scholarship such as this? Can you build relationships? Will you be able to actually walk away from the UK or wherever it is that you want to go to the US? Would you be able to walk away with relationships formulated? That's really what they're asking you. But what they want to do is they want you to tell them from past experience, what have you done to show that you actually do depict um, networking skills, right? Um, let me just let these people into the room. Okay, so um, I was having a conversation with a friend of mine and she was talking about how she doesn't, she doesn't know how to network. And I'm like, that's not true. If you look at your everyday life, think of one relationship that you've ever established that has helped you in your life. Either you met this person at a conference and you guys became um, you know, acquaintances, and you were able to draw on this person's inspiration and have them as a mentor. That's networking. If you were able to meet um, somebody at the shop, and then they told you about a place where you can volunteer, and then you started volunteering there, that's networking. So networking is being able to see where have I ever established a relationship that was able to work for me afterwards? If you once met a lecturer at school, and then you went to go and go um, have them help you in your career thereafter because they acted as an informant in as far as how can I move forward, 
that is called networking so relationships any relationship that you have that has worked for you is a networking relationship you just have to to weave out the example so that you can think of how it is you have been able to network in the past right so don't think as networking as just meeting at a conference the person offered you a job that was a networking relationship meeting at a conference the person became your mentor that was a networking relationship of course those are examples of networking relationships but more often than not some of us have other types of networking relationships so if you've ever had a situation where somebody helped review your essay somebody was able to give you um a, a, a heads up about a job application and then you applied and you got the job that's called networking it's building relationships okay and so in this process of applying and just you know putting your profile together you have to create a to-do list because sometimes it's possible that actually there's a lot that is lacking from my application and i need to fill in these gaps and so I find that when one writes a personal statement, you have to relate to the personal statement. What are the things about you that uh, make you the ideal candidate for the scholarship or even just the university course? And so that means that you have to depict and show how, if, if for example, you're interested in development, what are the things on a day-to-day -day basis that you do that actually show that you truly have this true, um, uh, that you truly have this this passion for for development so a lot of the times we think that can only show itself in having a charity organization that um, helps in the development sector but having a true love for development can be something like you consume the content of the times um, to uh, to to teach yourself on world economics and world global issues on development you have taken time out to research a subject that you know extensively you have um started a chat group that allows you guys to talk about world global issues you have all of those things show your interest so you have to think about have you ever traveled somewhere to go and go help your community because you're so touched by the fact that they're um, you know they're impoverished have you ever you know i don't know you'd have to actually like see through your your life and see what are the things that you've done that speak to this but if you find that you do come but uh, you come off empty and you get to a place where you realize that actually my um, skill set, as well as the things that I do on a daily basis, actually don't complement what I do. Well, then get involved. Start. If you need to start a development blog, get on it. If you have to join a, a charity organization so that you know you do have volunteering experience, get on it. Like at the end of the day, just strengthen your application. You can do so by looking at um, what you've done in the past, or you could actually get up and try to fill those gaps in by starting some of the things that you should um, actually have on your application. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay, so that means set your goals, be very clear as to what it is that you want. And so that brings us back to the conversation that even Martha had highlighted earlier, as in like, where are you going? You can't just want to go and go do a master's. Why do you want to do it? And sometimes, you know, when we're asked that question, we kind of like pause a bit and we're like, actually, I don't know. And that's okay, because now you can ask yourself the question. So Mavis, if you want to go and go do an MA in development, why? And then you can start to actually like lay out a plan. I'll be honest with you. When I did my first Chevening um, application three years ago, when they asked me about career goals, that was when I sat and I was like, hmm, what are my goals? And I started listing them. So I used the application as a platform to actually like inform like a, a, a timeline of what I'm trying to do because you also have to list your, your immediate goals, medium goals, and long-term goals. So then you can sit there and plan your life uh, on the Chevening application friend listen there's nothing wrong with that like we don't all have it together but it's okay for you to use certain platforms to actually pull it together so i use my shaving application to just just um reel in some of the, the the loose strings that were just around where i wasn't even sure like i do this and i do this but why you know so then i was able to sort of create like a clear uh cut um style approach where i was like this is why i do it this is how i've been doing it this is a time frame and everything. So that's where you can use um, the Chevening um, application or whichever application that you're doing to just list what you want to do. Okay, and then you have to understand what you need for the specific areas. I just need to see how much time I have because I have to time keep myself. I don't have somebody to do that for me. So I need to be done, I've got 10 more minutes. Okay, so then you have to be, um, understand what you need for your specific area of interest, which is what I spoke about, orientating your life to reflect the things that you are interested in. If you're interested in development, you've got to consume content that teaches you on development. So it's like you have to go to school without being in school. So let's get to the real um, important stuff in the, as far as my, my thing is concerned. So professional profile, right? You have to look at your professional work profile because you also have to be able to list like, uh, where have you worked in the past? 
so that you can actually clear some of the two-year work experience um, things that they have. But for undergraduate, that's not needed. That's just for MA or even PhD. So then um, you, so these are just some ideas that I'm giving you of some of the things that you can do to build your profile. So you can do some research papers, like start to think of a, a topic of interest that you have and write articles on it, publish them in uh, local newspapers or even just get a blog to publish them on. Um, academic papers are really uh, used um, at conferences. So like, equip yourself with knowledge as to like if i am a development expert what do development experts do and a lot of the times these professionals or academics or whichever usually write what they call academic papers which are presented at conferences that have to do with the development sphere or sector leadership take up leadership positions see how you can get involved um and leadership doesn't have to be all the way at the front of the ceo you can just get involved wherever however and just set yourself up so that you can build your leadership profile and portfolio because if you want to be a ceo one day or a manager you have to be able to show them how have you in the past led to get involved service sometimes do things out of service and not because you want something out of it not everything has to get you paid you don't have to volunteer at the fun walk uh, raising money for cancer because you want something in return you don't have to volunteer at uh, one or the other concert or something, or let's say um, conference because you wanna get paid, just get into the rooms so that you can learn. Sometimes it's okay to not have to be remunerated for your times and efforts because you learn and you build your resume and professional profile. And then recognitions and awards. I think the reason I, I wanna touch on this is because we think that that's what truly like sets us apart. Like you must have been awarded for the work that you do for you to feel that it's actually eligible. Like people must be like, oh great, you're doing so great. But it doesn't matter. Like a lot of the work that I did before accolades even came along, I did for a period of like four to five years before recognition even came with it. But that's because I wasn't doing it for the recognition that comes with it, but because they were, the heart of the matter was really what's important. So figure out what your heart of the matter is. What, where does your heart lie? And then get involved in that okay so platforms to use to build your resume because they're also going to check you out on social media we all know this because that's the area that we live in i mean every time somebody is looking for a job what do the recruiters do they go look on the social media platforms because we want to know do you have problematic views are you going to come cause trouble we know your life like that so <laughs> So uh, I, uh, online resumes are great, which is basically where you style yourself without having to actually hand in a CV. And LinkedIn is one such platform, which is absolutely great because we use LinkedIn kind of like, oh, just list your, your um, academic uh, qualifications as well as your work experience, and then we keep it moving. But the way that you use Instagram and Twitter and whichever, that's how you should be using LinkedIn, but rather as a um, online resume so that if you're trying to impress a recruiter, this is where you do it, especially if you want to work in like international organizations, they will check your Twitter and they will check your LinkedIn. So just make sure that the content that you're sharing on those platforms reflects who you say you are in your applications. And that's now the digital portfolio. There's another one, which is a website. They have like um, WordPress as well as Wix, which is basically where you can um, create uh, a profile and they have templates you don't have to be a graphic designer or web developer in order for you to be able to do that they have templates you just fill in things publish right and then your twitter instagram and facebook um i think if you want to use these platforms as like where you want to talk trash and just live your best life then don't use your real name because it's just going to be detrimental um alternatively if you do want to use it as a platform to be able to impress recruiters create relationships network and so forth then you need to watch yourself unfortunately it feels like you're being policed but a, at the at, at the end of the day you must think as the recruiter if, if you see this person's tweets and they're talking you know garbage all day it kind of just doesn't make them a very attractive candidate so you're welcome to use these platforms um you know to live your best life if that's what you'd like but then you have to be smart about how that affects um your career and so forth so usually especially if you want to talk trash and just like you know then don't use your real name i i just like look that's that's really mavis's opinion it doesn't have to cut across the board people think differently that's my opinion no okay how much time do I have? I feel like I'm talking a lot. Okay, so I have three minutes. I'm gonna cover this real quick. So social media, clean up your brand. If you do find that you've been swearing at people on social media and now you want an application, you want to apply to Chevening where they're gonna look at your um, handles or even whichever other application you wanna do, clean it up. Like literally clean it up. Like see where you've been either swearing at people, being homophobic, being 
you know people are like this i'm not saying you are i'm just saying okay cool so clean it up check out like uh check out your facebook your twitter your instagram check out your linkedin and just make sure that it actually speaks to who you are and who you say you are and then how to do so you can just um like it's so it's relatively simple to be able to clean up your social media you can just search like keywords that are obviously offensive and so forth um okay so i think that really kind of speaks for itself and then branding oneself this is really not really necessary but i thought to share it because um i think it's important firstly when you send an email it's quite important to be very professional when you do so so i usually recommend that you have a, a email signature and you can design these on an application called canva which is free um i should be able to share that link with you guys and it's very simple these templates you just edit download you're done your social media platforms depending how you want to utilize them be be reachable if you're going to become a subject expert in for example development make sure that people don't have to go and go like search for your aunt and your cousin in order to be able to get a hold of you but you should be reachable like either put up your email address one that's maybe like a public um, email address or whichever so these are just examples of some of the things that i've done these are very okay well my twitter is currently like this but this uh signature is so old shim okay cool um yeah so i think i've pretty much covered most of it i am good on time yes i am i've got 10 minutes for q a so weird because i'm the only one talking so i have to ask myself questions wow yeah so in as far as your profile is concerned i'm going to share two links of articles that i wrote in as far as just writing your essays and i put very practical steps and i also gave examples and everything so i'll share that with you I know it is a lot to take in, but I do hope that it's covered most of what you're needing as far as like branding and profiling yourself. Cool. Okay. Let's see. Okay. Hi, Andrina. Okay. Okay. That, okay. I see. Mavis, the link for the slide denied access. Okay. I'll, I'll do that in a bit. I'm currently in my fourth year doing a science course. However, I'd like to change to hospitality when applying. Should I use my honors after I'm done or just my grade 12? Okay. So I transitioned from civil engineering to uh, development. And the reason I did this is because I found that I liked engineering, but I didn't want to do design for the rest of my life because I kind of liked engineering because of the, the development aspect of it, like housing and solving the housing crisis, especially in my home country, Namibia. But I realized that as I went further, I couldn't truly use the engineering degree to um, do the change that I wanted to. Yes, I had a, a foundation, but I, if I was to enter any international organization that does development work, I'd actually have to transition into a development um, degree. So I applied to go to, to do an MA in globalization, business and development in the UK. And I used my engineering degree as the basis because I didn't want to go do another undergrad. I wanted to go do postgrad. So I used my undergrad in engineering to get into development. So a lot of the UK universities, I can't speak for the US, but they generally allow that transition. So you can apply always, always, no matter what you do, use everything you've got. Like if you've got a diploma in, I don't know, marketing, and you've got a, an undergrad in hospitality, and then you went to go and go do a course in leadership, use everything you've got when you apply, because they want to see like, what is your history of academics in order to be able to set you up for where you're going right cool um so use your your um hospitality stuff when you apply never ever omit anything when you're applying give the give them everything let them see through it <laughs> okay um hey derek i'm applying for so my name is not derek i'm using derek's account because the man's got premium i need to let the ghetto side of me go okay my name is Mavis. I'm applying for Shevening this year and I'd appreciate your help in terms of reviewing. Okay. So I did reviewing essays for two months. I, I did, um, I opened it up on my website and we basically did a whole lot of scholars, but unfortunately, because we realized, um, you know, everybody's so busy, it's just not in the long run, we could only do so many. So what we did is we decided to do this webinar to answer your questions so that we don't need to review your stuff because unfortunately we just don't have the capacity. So we've already done the reviewing and we're currently doing some of the scholars still, but unfortunately it's no longer open for anyone else. I'm sorry, but that's why we're here. So ask any question you want. Okay, last connection, kind of resend the link. Okay, thank you. How big of a role do public speaking skills play in professional networking? 
none because I know of I've got friends who are stark opposites of who I am and they do well in their networking because everybody is different you don't have to have a specific personality type in order to be able to set yourself apart or even know how to network it's really just a skill it's teaching yourself how to approach people it's teaching yourself how to be very strategic in establishing relationships the same way that you uh, with your introverted side or whichever skills, uh, whichever personality type you have, you're able to establish friendships. That's the same way that you do it in networking. So you don't have, and this is a, a good point. For example, you don't have to go to the most outspoken person, the most um, flamboyant person that you know of in the sphere or sector for you to actually establish relationships with that person. You can look for people who are like-minded, people who are like you, that reflect a lot more of what you're even looking for, where maybe you're soft-spoken and you're looking for somebody who can teach you how to navigate leadership um, you know, uh, positions while being soft-spoken. You can really look for like-minded people. The world, um, the beautiful part about the world is that we've got so much diversity, you know, that you really are able to do what you got to do. Okay, how much time do I have? I've got five minutes. Okay, um, where are we at? Does, okay, does being, an, an inact, does being inactive on social media hinder getting a scholarship? Absolutely not. If anything, that's the best because then they can't go and go find your tweets where you're talking about someone's shoe size or whatever. So um, again, I'll, I'll revert to my friends. I have friends who are not very uh, active on social media. Tio Polina is one of the ones that actually presented today and she does well. Like she, Tio Polina is very, very established without having to have a social media footing because she does her work um, through personal relationship and direct interaction with the companies that she works with. So social media is not that big a role, but if you are on social media, I just advise that you be wise with your usage as opposed to being reckless with it. But if if you're not it's not a problem okay does okay now how to position how to position awards accolades without it coming oh gosh up oh, is too much no friends show up i'm joking don't do that <laughs> okay so accolades right so the best way remember the star approach where you must talk you have to be strategic in, even in your positioning of your accolades in a, in, a, in an academic not academic essay in your application essays and the nice thing about that is that you're able to relate the work that you've done and show the impact and then show the sort of outcomes. So you can use the award as the outcome of what you did because you have to highlight what work you do, how you do it, with what you do it. And then you can be like, as a result of, um, you know, the work that I've done in A, B, and C, I was then awarded for this. So I do that a lot. I, I never just say I've been awarded A, B, C, D. It's like, okay, great, but why? right so the why in your award is very important so when you're highlighting your accolades and your awards make sure that you position them in relation to the question that you're answering per essay or per uh, part in the personal statement i hope i answered that correctly okay they spoke of three years industrial experience how do you go about that i just graduated last year so Martha, um, I think it's two years, it's not three, but also there's a certain number of hours that they ask for. So my suggestion to you is fill out the job experience part and see how many hours it counts up to. Because I find that when I list my volunteer work and I list my job and everything, the hours are actually quite immense. But if you have no work experience, Chevening is not going to consider your application, unfortunately, because one of their requirements is two years work experience. That's not to say you can't apply to another scholarship. So don't be discouraged if Chevening uh, requirements, you don't meet them, then just look for another one because there will be a scholarship that speaks to what you have usually. I have got feedback that this turns off application. Is, is this true? What turns off application? I don't know what you're talking about. You didn't complete your sentence. Okay, thank you, Mavis. This was much more motive, uh, of a motivation to do self-introspection and build this. First build, I'm so confused. Okay, I'm going to read it slower. Thank you so much, Mavis. This was more of a motivation to do a self-introspection and build best relationships ourselves first before building relationships with others. Well, yes, that is very, very important. But I think when we talk about networking, I just wanted to highlight that sometimes we overlook some of the networking relationships we've established on assumption that they're not relevant when actually they might be, if you can just frame them properly using the methodology that Martha shared. I think that the, the two slides that Martha shared on how to structure your sentence and how to like put your point across is literally the most important takeaway from this entire webinar. 
Do UK universities also offer wa waivers on application fees? Yes, they do. And oh, I, I love that question because what happens is when you apply to a university, you should go and go visit the university page and acquaint yourself with what scholarship opportunities they have. Because every single university has partner organizations and companies that sponsor the university. So although, for example, scholarship might, um, Shivening might, uh, um, um, Shivening might have a scholarship relationship with Sussex, it's possible that KPMG or whoever other organization might also have a scholarship relationship with Sussex. So my advice to you is every single university you apply to, also go and go look up the scholarships that they have specific to the university and apply to those. So to answer your question as far as the university, they have this thing where you can apply to a um, not, it's like a course or a department scholarship, and then they can waiver usually a percentage, never the whole tuition fee of your uh, of your uh, tuition fee. So yes, to answer your question, yes, that's possible, but you have to apply for it. When it let me see my time. Okay, I've got two minutes. When it comes to the world, the word. Do I have two minutes, guys? Um, Mubita starts at fifty. Yes, I do. Okay. Um, when it comes to the word limit in regards to the essay, would you advise one to strive for the minimum word or max? Shante, honey, please strive for the maximum. There's nothing worse than uh, opening an application and the words are this many. It looks like the person has nothing to say. And I'm not saying go and go fill it up all the way to 500 with just whatever it is you can think of, but rather just make sure that you're very elaborate in everything that you're supposed to state. Because in essence, 500 words is not supposed to be enough for you to even showcase who you are. Because you're supposed to draw from everything that you do. So use the space to speak, use the word um, to bring yourself across and just do the best in order to be able to highlight who you are. I do not advise that you ever go for the 100 uh, word minimum limit because that just makes it seem like you're not even that interested, like you're just doing this to get it over with. Because they also do kind of like, I mean, imagine you are a reviewer and you're opening all these applications and everyone is giving you 500 word limits and they're really going in and somebody else is, I mean, you could be very impactful in 100 words. I just, I kind of feel like you might not be as impactful as you should be in 100 words. That's just me though, but the decision is ultimately yours. I just don't advise it. I ask this because they say less is more. No, friend, no, no, no. More is like you, the thing is you have to sell yourself. You're literally a salesperson because you have to show these people that you've got the capability. It's, it's a job interview. It's, it's a scholarship application, but really you're applying for them to see you as the ideal candidate. So you have to be, to make sure that you bring your best foot forward. So less is more when you're punchy and you're getting straight to the point, but you could literally do less in more. Meaning that although you're striving for the 500 word limit, you're also making sure that you're not just rambling on. You're being very uh, punchy, you're being very specific, you're, 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 there's a flow. It has to be a good essay. Um, okay. Then this one last one, and then I'm gonna hand over to Mobita. Will we get a link to the slides? Um, yes, I'm gonna have to work on that. I'm probably gonna have to download it and then put a link of it on my um, website. So I'll, I'm gonna share the two shivening essays that I have where I kind of gave advice and tips. And then on that very website, just keep your eyes out on it. I'm gonna, a lot of the content that I ever have, I always just put it there so it's in one place. So yes, you will have access to it. It's just a question of when. So I am on time. I'm a minute over, that's terrible. So, Mubita, hi. I have spoken for 30 minutes straight, it's not fun. Hi, Mavis. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you perfectly fine. Okay. All right, so Mubita is going to take over now. He too is a Shevening Scholar. We actually share university. Um, so he will do the rest of the talking from this point forward. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mubita. Uh, maybe it says Mubita because she mentions the B, but silent B. Mubita, I come from Zambia and I am a Shevening Scholar at the University of Sussex. I think my, my job is easier than everyone else's because everyone is giving you all of this stuff about how you can get into the schools and get scholarships and all of that. I think that mine is a much more subtle approach because you guys need to understand that there's a psychological aspect to applying for scholarships and applying for school in the UK, in the US and all of that. And I'm just going to try and suss out what that is. And then also later on in my presentation, um, give you some sort of checklist for what you need to do before you are, before you come to study in the UK um, as you settle and uh, going forward getting by. Um, yeah, so maybe if you help me with my next slide, um, which is mostly what I'm going to be speaking on. So 
the first part of my talk is about imposter syndrome. And then the next part of my talk is going to be about navigating studies. So I really like this slide and picking from what someone said before, I really like someone saying less is more. So I'm going to try and do less is more. <laughs> but yes, I'll get to 500 words also. So if you look on the right side of my presentation, it says there's a mouse telling a mouse that they are an imposter. I'm sorry, Mavis, you have just unshared my presentation. Just give me a second so I can sort this out. I okay. accidentally opened. Um, where are we? It just accidentally opened the many mm -hmm. tabs on my PC and now. Oh, come on, friend. Yes, there we are. Yeah, okay, are. yeah, so I was talking about the mouse on the right side of uh, the screen telling the other mouse that you're an imposter. But then the question is, which of these mice is an imposter? Because if the mouse is an imposter, can the other mouse work in a computer? Or vice versa, if the other mouse is the actual imposter, can the other mouse run around and find cheese, you know? Um, if you forget everything else that I will say about this slide, remember this one thing. Each of these mice serves its own purpose in the work that it, it does. Um, and this is key in understanding and navigating imposter syndrome. Your ability to understand that each person serves a purpose that is different from the other in as much as you might feel out of place when you're in the context of someone else. So when the computer mouse is with my, the other mice, it might feel that it's an imposter. Similarly, when the other mouse is with the computer mice, it will feel like it's an imposter, even though both of them are called mice. Um, so now I'm gonna talk about imposter syndrome itself. Big term, what is imposter syndrome? At some point in our lives, all of us feel like we don't belong. This is specifically true for scholarship applications. If you've applied once and twice and three times and you failed all the time that you applied, you start to feel like maybe this is not for me. Maybe I'm not cut out for it. But it's the same thing for those that apply and are chosen for the scholarships. They're chosen for this great scholarship. You arrive to study in the UK, in the US, and you look at all of these smart people and you say, oh my God, they'll find me out. I'm such a fraud. You know what I mean? So imposter syndrome, it's an actual real thing. It exists on both spectrums, when you fail and when you succeed. So before I dive into what it looks like, um, I just want to share a few of the things that trigger it because of the fact that it's so common. Sometimes we don't notice that there are triggers in our lives that trigger imposter syndrome. So I'll go through one of them. The first one is success. Every time you succeed, there's a part of you that makes that, just before, the same, same slide. Um, yeah, every time you succeed, there's usually that feeling inside of you that tells you maybe I made it by luck. And when that feeling is not checked, it can cripple you so much that you fail to interact with the people in your space because you feel like they're better than you are. You just made it by luck. That's one. The second one that sort of makes us, that triggers imposter syndrome in us is expectations. Oftentimes in our lives, we set such high expectations for ourselves that when we don't meet them, we start to feel like we're less. I applied for achieving. I didn't make it and now I feel like it's a lofty ambition because the expectation has been cut off. The third one, much obvious in this situation is rejection. Whether you've been rejected in a relationship or for a scholarship, it will trigger the I am not good enough part. You know what I mean? I mean, but also some of them are much more subtle. I mean, of course, success, rejection, and, and, and um, what I talked about when I say the uh, expectations, but then some of them are just much more psychological because of the way that you were raised. Looking at other people makes you feel like maybe you are not a part of them. And so having told you what the triggers are, I now want to tell you what it looks like when you have imposter syndrome. Do you constantly tell yourself you made, you made it by luck? Do you constantly tell yourself, I can't apply for Chapening, Commonwealth, me. The Chapening is probably for smart people or leaders or people who have done a lot of great things in your life. Like, there's all these nagging feelings. If you're one of those people, you probably have imposter syndrome. Are you one of those people at work or at school who feels like if someone should have an opinion, it's not you, you probably are suffering from imposter syndrome. Um, imposter syndrome is so common that it 
it exists everywhere at school at work at church you feel like you're less holier than others that is also an imposter syndrome um, yeah that is also a symptom of imposter syndrome so now having dealt with triggers and also what it looks like how do you deal with imposter syndrome right like how do how do i get to a point where yeah now i've realized that this imposter syndrome is causing me to not apply to scholarships that are for me or it's causing me not to apply to courses that i feel i'm qualified in because I have the marks for him. How do I deal with this imposter syndrome? So I, I don't have hard and fast rules. So I, what I'm going to give you is tips from my own life, um, how I have been able to deal with imposter syndrome, because for the most part, and I'll give you this as a story, um, I too failed to get into evening the first time when I applied, uh, that crushed me. I had to go away for a bit and come back for to recalibrate. But then the next time I applied, dealing with that, I am not good enough. Feeding uh, has taught me so much about myself. And this one thing I want you to know: when it comes to goals, achieving them, whether it's success or marriage or scholarship or anything, it is much less about reaching the goal than it is about the person you become in the process of the goal. There is a lot of character development to be seen and to be fulfilled in your process than there is when you reach your final goal. And that in itself, if you realize it, will help you deal with your imposter syndrome. First of all, congratulations that you're feeling imposter syndrome. It means you're getting out of your comfort zone. And this is one thing that most people don't realize. As long as you are in your comfort zone, you will not feel like an imposter. But when you step out of what you're familiar with and you get into new territory, now you get to realize the feelings of uneasiness because you want to navigate a new space. So if you're feeling imposter syndrome, congratulations, because now you're getting out of your comfort zone and that's where the good things are. You know, one thing you should realize with imposter syndrome, if you're going to deal with it is number one, I am this person. I am worth it. If you've made it into a scholarship, that's who you are. That's who you are. You are just like everyone else that made it. And here's the funny thing with scholarships like Chivling or Commonwealth, they pick only 1%. Sometimes the most they can pick is 2% of total applicants. So when you make it there and you start to feel like you don't belong, everybody else feels the same way. You just need to recognize that and place the feeling to it. You are in the 2%, you know what I mean? And so at the end of the day, what you must first deal with is your self-perception. Remember with the mice, I said, both of them serve a purpose in their environment. You are there in that scholarship, in that course, to serve a purpose in your environment. You know, so you're not the other mouse, but you are your own mouse, and your own mouse has a reason. You know what I mean? And so that's the first part. The first part is you need to recognize that you're worth it. Number two is that you need to accept that what you're dealing with is imposter syndrome. A lot of times we don't deal with things because we don't ac accept them. When you accept that this is what you're going through, it's easier for you to navigate it because you have put a name to it and then you have decided to deal with it. And then the third thing is, if it overwhelms you, speak to someone. I've always said, and I said this to Mavis the other day, you heal from what you reveal. As long as you keep it to yourself, it will nag you. But when you reveal it to others, you realize that they're also fighting with the same things. Studying in the UK for me, and maybe also in the US or wherever you're gonna go study, has a funny effect in that it puts you in a different culture. And so because you're in a different culture, you start to feel like maybe everybody else knows how to be UK. You know, <laughs> maybe everybody else has had previous, like prior experience with being in such an environment and I'm such an African, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know how to do these things. But one thing you need to realize is that everybody is going through the same things. And when you reveal these things, you get into a process of healing because you then realize that you're not the only one. Even studying, you find that your friends look like they're doing the readings and you're not. And so you start to feel like, oh my God, they'll find me out and now I will fail. Uh, if I go back home having failed as a evening scholar, I am not going back. I'll just send an email that I died and then I'll be an illegal immigrant in the UK. But like, <laughs> when you start to speak to your friends, you start to realize that everybody's going through the same thing. So that's, so number one, recognize that who you are has a purpose. Number two, um, accept. Number three, speak to someone. And number four, just do you. The fact that you've come this far, the fact that you've applied for a scholarship, now you have learned the lessons and the process has taught you something. Do it again. Do what you are good at. Um, funny thing is my, my previous application was not any different from the one that I made that got me into achievement. 
So imagine if I had given up and said, I can't do this anymore. And then I applied again and I got in. Sometimes it's just times and seasons. Maybe the season is not ready for your greatness yet. So you need to wait it out, but try again. Like you never give up, you never stop because you recognize who you are. And that in itself, you're a gift to the world, you know, and you need to see that. This is not, not like motivational speaking one-on-one. This is a person that's felt so many times telling you what it takes to get it. You need to stop this idea of feeling like you're not good enough. You're in, you're in the world for a purpose. If you were not good enough, you would, I don't know, something would have happened to you, but you're still here. So which means that's living, breathing sign that you have purpose. And if you really want it, you will get it. And that's just how it is. So the other part is the importance of owning your applause. And this will happen to a lot of you when you get into your dream place, your places, places of your dream, when you finally get your scholarship, when you finally get into that course, when you're finally studying abroad. There is a part of you that, you, that will feel like you need to be humble about your successes. Uh, someone said that they were right who they are in 100 words. Um, that also comes from a place of uh, less is more, I'm being humble, I'm, I shouldn't go have hubris and speak pride. Listen, blow your own trumpet, nobody's gonna do it for you. This is your chance, you know? If you don't blow it well, that's your fault. You know what I mean? So you need to come to an understanding of the difference between pride and owning your applause. Um, you have done so many great things, uh, and if no one has ever told you this in your life, let me tell it to you, I'm proud of you so far. The fact that you're in this webinar, I'm proud of you. Not the person you were yesterday or the person that you hope to become after you get your master's or the person that you are now, the one that's trying, the one that's doing their best. This is the person I'm, I'm proud of and you need to own that. You know what I mean? There's an importance in owning what you have become and what you have beaten so far that you have even looking at the prospect of doing a master's abroad. That in itself takes courage. A lot of people are just okay with settling and saying, I'll do what I can back home. And you know, the truth is I was laughing at myself um, when all the other speakers were speaking because they're all Namibian and this is like such a Namibian crowd. And I was telling myself, maybe I should have imposter syndrome. I don't belong here. You know what I mean? <laughs> but the thing is, you need to realize that you're the one that's speaking to the crowd. And so you need to own your applause. So yeah, I'm here owning my applause. I'm speaking to you guys about beating imposter syndrome and I'm a living, breathing example of it right now in this moment. So you need to own that. Tell your story because nobody else will. Um, I hope I've impo uh, exhausted imposter syndrome, but I'll deal with the practicalities in your questions because I know this is much more practical. So navigating study abroad. Number one, before you study abroad, there's certain things that you need to figure out. People have already talked about you figuring out your purpose, your why, um, which course you want to study. So I'll not go into those, but what I will go into is you guys recognizing that studying abroad is taxing, both on your finances, on your psychology, and also on your future sustainability. So you need to prepare for that. So there are three plans you need to make before you go. One, make a plan for your life. What's going to happen to me in this one year or two years I'll be abroad? Number two, make a plan for your family, the people that depend on you, because they're going to need to survive somehow without you being present, but also you still being in the picture. Number three, make a plan for your school. Do not dare go and study without a plan, because if you don't have a plan, anything will happen and you'll be satisfied with it. So if your plan is, I want a distinction and this is how I'll do it, do that. So that's before you go. Number two, getting started. You have applied, you have gotten in, and now you need to do the actual getting started. So you need to plan for your trip, you need to plan your itinerary, you need to know which ticket you're going to buy and how cheap it is. If the scholarship is doing that for you, great, but also you need to have an idea of where you're going. Um, research the weather, research the culture, research the language, research every nice thing that you would like to do as you go there, make sure that every table is turned. Check your visa, check if your passport is expiring soon because there's some people who their passports are expiring in two days and you need to travel. And then the, because if your passport expires while you're in the UK or in the US, you need to renew it and that's a, such a tedious process. So you need to make sure that those things are in check. Um, also, uh, this is a session on its own, how to travel, but like <laughs> make sure you have the essentials for traveling. Uh, make sure you don't do illegal things at the airport. But like those are things that we can deal with in your questions if you want. Getting settled has a lot to do with you guys knowing the place that you're going into. You're here for school, primarily. Yes, marriage will come, possibly, hallelujah. 
having fun will come. You will travel to all the places you want to travel, but focus. You are here for school. So getting settled has a lot of routine that has to settle in. Um, focus on how you do your school. School here is so much different from back home, wherever you're from. Um, it's research intensive. There's a lot of planning that you need to do on your own. So you need to structure a way in such, if you're coming from work, it's easier because you can just tell yourself, I'll do from nine hours to 17 hours or from nine to five. And so you will leave your room, go to, a, go to a place that's like an office for you, sit there like the way you do in an office, do your to-dos and then get back. But for most of you who are not coming from uh, work, those of us coming from undergrad into postgrad, the transition is difficult and sometimes you get lethargic. The weather also will deal with you. So getting settled has a lot to do with you understanding your environment and making a plan for that. So getting by, try and find the best way to get free stuff. <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of ways. And if you can't get free stuff, get cheap stuff. If you can't get cheap stuff, manage your finances. And so the next speaker is going to speak about finances, so I'll not belabor that point. I hope that I'm on time. Have I wasted a lot of time, Mavis? Oh, friend. <laughs> no, but don't worry about it because we're going to do it. Um, Rita, I'm going to have you do your own Q&A alo alone. Mm -hmm. And then I'll have MC come in after you and she'll be the last speaker. Okay, cool, cool, cool. So I'm done with the presentation. I hope that you guys have gotten some nuggets and some truth out of it. So I will now hand over to MC. Thank you so no, much. No, no, no. You're going to do the, the Q&A now. Q &A. Yeah, we're going to okay. do the Q&A alone and then MC will be over and she'll have her own slot. Okay, okay. So here are some questions that I, okay, well, let's start with this one actually. Okay. I guess the imposter syndrome is magnified even more when you're a black African student in the EU or the UK. Do you agree? How do you continuously work on this? Where were there some of your expectations of the UK, your studies that were not met once you actually arrived? Uh, so with imposter syndrome, I guess you, the, what can I say? The intricacies of it have less to do with what you look like or where you are. Um, yes, there's a potential to magnify based on your ethnicity, but those are in your head, to be honest, because everybody is going through the same thing. Remember, most students that are studying where you're studying are international students in a different environment. So they are all aware of who they are, um, the color of their skin, their ethnicities, and their inadequacies. You know? So this, these are the things that amplify your triggers. So you need to be aware of that and do that on your own. Um, how do you continue to work on it? The same things that I said. Tell yourself who you are, you have purpose. Accept that you're going through this. And then when you accept, try and do the best that you can to deal with it day by day. Everybody's dealing with the same thing. But were, some of, were there some of my expectations of studying abroad that were not met once? So I like to tell myself not to have expectations. Expect everything and then expect it never happens. But... Um, there are aspects of certain things that I expected that expectation and reality are two different things. And you, you need to be a flexible person in that when you get to your promised land, you also need to deal with what you have. So the answer to your question is yes. Some of my expectations were not met, but then they were not met because they were not as I pictured them. They were not met because maybe I under expected you know, and then I saw, sort of like saw a difference in that. I'm still in the UK. I mean, I'll answer this question progressively over the year. So maybe we can talk about it. But like, that's basically just so far so good. Okay. And um, so the next question is, in most cases, I do understand that one has to pursue their goals or like further studies, but the risk comes in when you're already employed. Most companies don't have the policy to put you on study leave for over a period of 12 months. How does one come to a conclusion of resigning in a world where unemployment is, uh, the unemployment rate is so high? So I'll revert to before you do. So before you do, number one, make a plan for yourself. <laughs> make a plan for your family, the people that depend on you. And make a plan for your studies. That is where all of this hinges on. So I'll tell you my story. Um, I wanted to apply for achieving in 2014 but then I didn't have two years experience. So after two years, I had experience in 2016, but I was working for an American company. Um, they could not allow me to have the study leave to come. So I quit that job, really good paying job. And I said, I can't do this. So I'm, I'm walking away because I really want to achieve it. People find that funny. My family was like, what are you crazy? <laughs> you know what I mean? But then I, I, I got a job in the government 
specifically because if you work for them for 24 months, you get study leave. And so I started to work for the government, pushed my 24 months, applied for evening, then got rejected. Can you imagine my disappointment? Oh, God. But then I pushed a year later, and now I'm here. Um, so I have that study leave. I am on a paid sabbatical from the government, but then my story is not like everyone else's story. Um, I cannot tell you what you must do, but the thing with goals, again, like I say, it's not so much about hitting the goal. It's about the person you become in the process of it. Most of the people that don't push for their goals are people who are scared of the potentialities of what will happen if I get out of my comfort zone. Your family will not die, to be honest. And I know that they love you and they'll understand. But if you don't make it also, um, that might be risky for your family. So the question is back to you. Are you a risk taker? And how far are you willing to go for your dreams? Yeah. So make those three. I points. love that. I love yeah. that. So there's another question. Uh, we've got about uh, two minutes left. What are the requirements one needs to have to be considered for a scholarship? This is from Paris. So different scholarships, different requirements. Um, we could go through what all of those are, but there's a lot of scholarships uh, for me to give like a generic answer. But I think that one of the things that you really need to qualify for a scholarship is self-belief. Uh, that's the overarching one. Like no matter what uh, expectations scholarship committees or boards have over you, you need to be confident enough to tell your story mm. because no one is going to do it for you. That's a vague answer. <laughs> No, but it's a great answer. I, I like the fact that you, I, I love it. I absolutely love it. Honestly, um, I think conversations on imposter syndrome are so important because, you know, we could be here, you know, pushing people to go apply. You got it. But then we're not dealing with the fact that they're dealing with some psychological um, and mental sort of uh, barriers that they don't know how to get past. And maybe just putting it into perspective will help them understand that, yes, you're going to feel like, you know, the inadequacy might come, the, the voice that makes you feel like you're not worthy will come but at the end of the day you have to push past that so thank you so much Mubita. i really appreciate it i'm glad that we got to do this. especially like i think this segment is so paramount because when you build on like go apply get a scholarship and it's like okay but here's what's going to happen to you mentally i i love this thank you so much Mubita. so um we're now going to move on to mc so mc is our last speaker for the for the day. I would like you guys to please indicate in the chat whether you would like to also have a session where you talk. We can do that for five minutes max. And if not, we'll call it a day after MC is done speaking. So MC, can you kindly um, unmute yourself so that you can take over? And so okay, I MC, no, uh, let me just to, to say it. So MC um, studied, she's done. And the reason we're ending off with MC is just to have a look backwards. You know, we're, we're looking from this angle as in you're applying, but we also want to give you a bit of a insight in as far as what happens after you're done. Because if you're going to be planning your life and you have to do career planning, you also have to be thinking of, okay, so this is a year or however long your masters will be, what happens afterwards? So MC is our last speaker. Let me know in the chat if you'd like to talk with us afterwards. Otherwise, we can close up after she's done. MC, please go ahead. All right. Um, is the video on? Um, okay. Uh, it says that you disabled my video, Mavis. Okay, great. All right. Can you hear me all? Okay, great. Okay, so uh, just a bit of introduction. My name is MC Erastus, and I was a Chief Dean Scholar for the 2019-2020 cohort. And right now I, am, I'm, I did my master's in media and communications at the London School of Economics. That's where I went to school. Um, I think in the spirit of trying to dismantle imposter syndrome, I would like to start off by saying Congratulations for coming this far. I mean, the fact that you are in, in this chat group already shows that you are in some process trying to already align your future to wherever it, your goal or whatever it is that you want to achieve. So congratulations for making it this far. Don't let anything stop you because everyone that makes it, I mean, everyone in this world is qualified. So you are qualified to be in any spaces that you want to be in and don't let anyone tell you differently, All right? So I wanted to talk about, um, because obviously I've been to the places and I know Movita, 
name right, <laughs> uh, he sort of like touched on some things, but I wanted to start off by talking a bit about, um, I'll talk about culture shocks and I'll talk about some money saving tips as well as like time management and something that's very important to me is mental wellness. So I want to touch on that as well. And then networking and friendships as well as um, taking advantage of the system. That's what I decided to title that one. The first thing I think everyone, we are coming from different places. If you're going to the States or you're going to the US or anywhere in Europe, um, there are also people who apply to the Erasmus Mundus Scholarship, for example, which takes you to different countries around um, Europe, all the world. So I think jet lag, the first thing is that you really need to rest and not exhaust yourself on your first weeks when you arrive, because you are going to have a very hectic year, if I can put it that, that way. So like rest, yes, you have to catch up and everything, but also try to get that just to get off the jet lag, especially if the time difference is very high between where you are coming from and you know where you are going to study. So try to do that as much as possible. And uh, I think, I mean, we use the term that we are now a global village. So realize that um, most of my friends that I met, we had a lot in common because we are both somehow raised by pop culture. So know that the people who are coming to be with you are people who are just as scared as you are as well. They are having their own fears. They have their own insecurities. And the first weeks will be the perfect weeks for you to connect with people. So you see to relax, you see to connect with people because everyone is looking for connections. They are looking for people to talk to. Uh, people like, especially in the UK, most students who come there are students that are coming from different countries. My university has like 70% um, in the national students. So like the first week was my time to really connect with people. So you pick up some networks and then you pick up some friendships when it comes to that. And then, um, <coughs> Something that you should never do in the U.S., please never use the black caps or the yellow taxis. Don't do it. They are so expensive, and they know that students don't know where they are going most of the time, so they might take long ways because you are paying per meter. So what you can do, there are a lot of apps that you can research on transport when you get there. Uh, you can try to pre-book, uh, try to find the cheapest one. What I did, I took a bit of cash and I negotiated my way with the people who were at the airport. So like with an Uber and you, you tend to pay way cheaper if you are paying some people cash. So like try to find as many um, opportunities as possible because the first week you can be trapped into spending a lot of your, um, your st stipend or your budget. You can go over budget if you are not very careful with that. So live in a very... Uh, live within your limit, if I can put it that way, when it comes to money. And try to come up, um, try to choose. I know most people I'm sorry if they're staying outside, but like what they mm -hmm. So, so your, your audio keeps coming in and out. I would suggest you uh, take off your video because it usually helps um, so that the audio doesn't keep um, disrupting. Okay, let's see how it goes. Okay, good. Is that fine? Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. All right. So can you guys hear me now? Yes, we can. OK, great. So um, let me actually jump into mental uh, wellness. We know that we are, most people are applying for, for university during a time that is very difficult for everyone else. And it's very important for you to take care of your mind. It's very important for you to um, be mentally aware of what is going on in your life. So a lot of universities, including Chivning and Commonwealth, they have what they call mentors. And these mentors can be, or your universities have academic mentors as well. And these people are put there for a reason for you to engage with them, for you to share what you're feeling. And even now, uh, for people who are right now applying, I would also really, really advise that you get someone to sort of take you through. It doesn't have to be someone who's in the field. It can just be someone that you are 
sort of like mentally accountable to because it's something that we really ignore but it comes into us i mean we, um, Movita is talking about imposter syndrome and it's something that you can arrest if you are too or you have people who are helping you with it you don't need to go through all these mental um battles by yourself like um the world is there and we have people that can help us with this for a reason especially if you do go for your studies um which i hope you all do will be please just the moment you get there try to find yourself someone uh from your university from your scholarship reach out and try to find someone that can just help you with that um and that will take me into taking advantage building networks and friendships and taking advantage of the system um, most scholarships would have what you call events that they do monthly or they do, you know, some of them would go on ballot, uh, meaning that um, the, you have to apply and they will accept you to go to a certain event. I would really, if you do go through this process and you are in the UK, for example, uh, do apply to these events because they build and they add uh, to your network. Remember that, for example, Chivning brings over 1,000 something leaders from all over the world. And this is your community. So you need to start connecting and building friendships and building networks with this community as well. So uh, get engaged on different groups because like in our year, uh, feminists had their own groups. We had um, uh, different people, engin engineers had their own groups. So you get connected to like-minded people. So don't just, I know it's not easy for everyone. Not everyone is an extrovert. Some people are introverts, but then try to put yourself out there. It's just for a year or it will be two years of your life that you sort of like living your best life for that year. And don't be limiting yourself for that. And of course, obviously, you have to balance that with your studies because you went there to study and you shouldn't um, ignore that. So try to find some sort of like balance, have some sort of like time management because with some universities, the work is a lot and i know people keep talking about this so prepare yourself already for that try to start if you don't read try to train your mind already to start reading envision yourself being there and just do that just read and keep reading and keep reading because that way you are training your mind especially if you have been out of university for some time you are training your mind to prepare yourself for the year that is coming for you in that. And when you get there, you are not going to crash down, but also know that it's okay to crash down. It's not something that is not normal. And we need to normalize, um, you know, not being okay mentally. And when we struggle, we need to reach out to a community. So develop yourself some sort of community that you can connect with as well. Yeah, I think from my presentation from that side, in terms of what you should do um, when you come to the UK, uh, I'm done with that. I do, uh, I mean, like, have some sort of like um, some questions that some people were asking, for example, about the GRE, which is the graduate examination for the US, for example. Uh, I know that most universities in the US, it's like taking the ALTS test, for example, you have to take that for most universities. There are ways for you to go around it, especially if you can prove yourself certain universities, maybe if you had really great uh, scores, you can plead your case, you can ask for, as much as you can ask for application waivers, you can also ask for some of these requirements to be waived from your applications as well. So nothing is impossible unless you try it. So as much as it's needed, you can plead your case before, you know, and there's nothing wrong with pleading your case. It won't stop people from um, considering your application. It just shows that you are actually, you know what you want. Yeah. Okay, that's perfect. So MC, what I'm going to do is, um, so because we had a bit of a disruption, we had a bit of a technical difficulty, Derek is here to present. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let Derek present um, for 10 minutes and then we're going to call it wraps for that. And then what we'll do is we'll all come back and I'll allow everybody to switch on their video and we'll just have sort of a 10, 10 minute um, conversation where everybody can just sort of 
informally ask their questions and so forth. So um, I think what we'll do now is we'll let Derek present and then we'll allow most of the speakers back into the room and then we'll allow the participants to also just show us what they look like and ask us a few questions so that it's a bit more informal. Um, so thank you so much, MC. That was so insightful. I realized that I didn't even go into your slides. Wow, I am so terrible at this. <laughs> It's just because I have to admit people reply to messages. It's been um, interesting. So MC, stick around, please, because we'll do the Q&A. Okay. So Derek, right. um, if you don't mind, kindly unmute yourself. Thank you so much. I'm so glad you're here. Uh, okay. So I just need Derek to unmute himself. Yeah, I'm here. I hope everyone can hear me. Yes, we can hear you now. So the floor is all yours. All right. Um, let me try to send my video on. Um, okay, good. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm really glad to join you. Um, I'm currently studying in the UK. Um, I'm based in London, but currently calling in from Chester. I did some travel to play a gig around. So um, I'm just returning from church. But anyway, I'm really excited to be part of this um, assembly. I thought that was very necessary to, to chip in, to share a few words. I, am, I come from a background of entrepreneurship, innovation, um, disability and education. Um, I work um, in, in Ghana and I develop technologies for persons with disabilities and also technologies for everybody. What we basically do is how do we ensure that whatever product we develop is accessible to everyone. And so that's the background I'm coming from. I did my undergrad in Ashesi University in Ghana where I studied business administration and did some, some professional course with Mavis at Cambridge University. Um, in leading change and then I'm currently studying, I have a very rare privilege to be a Chevening scholar and to be studying at University College London and Loughborough University and the London College of Arts. So I think I'm special, I get to study in three universities and my course is focused on disability design and innovation. Um, I have had the opportunity to be in certain corridors and be in certain rooms and meet certain people and also get some recognitions that I think that I've been very privileged. And it all came as a result of a few things that I did, which I hope to share. That, um, that is intended on how, how do you position yourself to dominate and how do you build yourself belief, right? I believe that as human beings on earth, there is a reason why we are on earth. We are just not on earth. We are not on earth to just live, eat, and sleep. But we are on earth to bear fruit. We are on earth to produce results. We are on earth to, to take charge, take over, take control. Right? And so the question we need to keep asking ourselves is, how do we take control? We don't have the luxury to be okay with whatever stage that we are on we are continually and constantly being challenged to make sure we are giving out our best, make sure that we are taking the best opportunity as much as possible and make sure that we are basically dominating, right? Um, I think that, um, I think that as young people, very, very, a lot of people tend to take the back seat and just relax and be behind and just feel like, oh, everything is all cool and everything is fine and no one to be able to, be in the lead and take advantage of the opportunities that are presented to them and ensure that they are dominating. I am very young, and but I think that I have been able to dominate in a lot of areas in Africa and even around the world. I've, I was very, very privileged to be one of the most influential young Africans for two years continuously um, in science and technology. Um, as a business student, right? That's that's interesting because I have a business background. I didn't do anything programming, but how did I move from being a business student to becoming most influential in Ghana and also in Africa, and also getting so many awards? Now I can't count. It's been more than fifteen important internationally recognized awards, and these are not awards just for the namesake, but really for evidence and clear evidence of work done. So the question is, how did I navigate this space? How did I even move from being a business major to dominating in the space of science and technology and really using my work to create impact for persons with disability? And so today, I hope that this gives you a, a little brief. I know I have very, very, very short time, 
but I'll, I'll run through quickly what I think you need to be doing. All right, so um, the first thing I think that you need to do is to have a vision board. Um, have a vision board. Now, a vision board basically gives you an idea of where you are going. You would not, anybody who does not know where he or she is going, basically wastes his um, or her time on everything that he or she finds herself to do, right? If you don't have a plan, then you basically have no aim, right? It's very, very important to ask yourself, where do I want to be in five years? Where do I want to be in 10 years, right? And it's not only enough to just ask yourself that question. It's very important. Even the Bible says that we should write the uh, vision on tablets that it may come to pass, right? So we need to be able to jot that vision down and, and write that down and on on a, on a board on our wall that we see every day every morning that can be able to guide us and that can be able to remind us of why we are on the path because a lot of us i I, feel, I believe that sometimes we forget why we are on the vision we forget why we are even living sometimes we even forget why we are pursuing a certain path so it's very very crucial to ask yourself why am i living what do i want to achieve in the next three years or in the next five years or in the next one year Right. If you are if you are applying for a university, then your vision in the next one year is to be in one of these three schools. Right. Then you need to ask yourself, what are the things I need to be doing to be able to get there? Today, most of my friends ask me, how are you able to get all these opportunities? How are you able to get all these things? How are you able to get these awards and travel around the world and all that? And I tell them that I have been preparing towards this. Right. It didn't just come out of a bubble. It's been a lot of preparation. When I was in my undergrad, I started serving people. When I was in my first year, I joined the outreach committee. That's where I learned how to organize things in um, start projects. I did my internship in an organization that made me design a whole project worth over $100,000. That was my first year, right? And, and in, in my undergrad, second year, I started two projects at the same time, one training blind students to use computers, second one training children to play music, right? It was preparation because I knew that where I wanted to go to, I need to gather leadership skills. I need to gather a lot of evidence to show my leadership skills. I need to, because I, will know, I know that I will need it when I'm writing graduate applications or when I'm looking for funding or when I want to set up a business, you know, because I had a very clear vision of the kind of leader I wanted to be, I needed to prepare towards that, right? And so I was able to map up all the things that I needed to do. Um, there is a lot to talk about vision, and there is a, so much I can talk about in terms of your vision, how to draw it down, how to map it, how to connect it. But I think for today, just know that it's important to have a vision, but break it down with a five years vision plan, or even a one year, break it down into months. You know that every month, these are the things I want to be able to achieve at the end of the month. It will really help you. The second thing is to examine yourself. Honestly, because I believe that so many of us don't really know who we are, right? And so we end up spending our time on a lot of things that do not really help us, right? Instead of focusing on what our strengths are and knowing how we need to get people to support us in our weaknesses, because we don't know, or sometimes we are just not honest, right? For example, you have someone come up with an idea and the person believes that that's the best idea, but the person, is, the person knows the gaps in the idea, but will never accept that this idea needs this to be done. There are people who are not good with accounting, but because they want to show off that they are good in managing business, they end up wanting to control every part of it, and then they fail, right? So it's important to be honest with yourself, know what your strength in is in, and know how you can mobilize people to to push yourself forward. A typical example for my case, I'm coming from a business background. I have very good idea generation skills. I have, I know how to mobilize people, but I suck at technology, right? And that was then. I didn't know anything about programming. I didn't know anything about computing, but I knew that with the ideas that I had, I needed to put people to who are good in computing to be able to execute it. I was very honest with myself, Derek, you don't know anything about this recruit a team and that is how we have come and this is how far we have come right today my organization is one of the lead organizations when you talk about assistive technology when you talk about accessibility in africa 
right? And then we have created a modern way of creating technologies for persons with disability. Nothing like this would have been possible if I was not honest with myself, if I, I didn't identify that, oh, I'm just good with ideating, I'm just good with managing people and bringing people together. But the real work, I'm not really good at it. So let me just get the right people. And sometimes now I'm realizing that I'm not really good at managing people. I, I'm realizing that mm, I'm just good at um, setting an idea, having a vision, writing down the vision and telling people the vision. But really to manage people, I think I'm not very good. So now I'm really looking at someone who can be able to manage our operations and drive the organization forward better than I can. Right? And that's how you dominate because when the organization is successful, you become successful. In the same way, if you realize that you are not very good in your application, maybe there is a particular part that you don't really have a strength in, you need to have conversations with people. Can you please give me an assessment or can you please guide me through something? Because nobody is an island and we all need people. Um, I can share one last example on that, which is very profound. You, do you know that Facebook at some time was making about $10 million in losses? It took just one person. Mark Zuckerberg met with the person, Sheryl Sandberg, over six times at dinner, just to talk and try to convince her to join. And Sheryl Sandberg moved from Google to Facebook, and within 10 years, Facebook was making over $23 billion in profit. Right? That is the power of one person to be able to transform um, you and make sure that you are dominating, right? I think that the second, the third point is to ensure uh, that. I want to chip in. Um, three minutes left. Uh, All right. So chip in just so that you you are able to still get to the end of what you're doing. All right, that's helpful. So the the third point I want to talk about is develop your competence. Some of us we are too comfortable and and we don't see a need to to get better. We think that we have reached. You know, any any time, anywhere you want to get to, think about the best person. If you want to be ahead of the best person, then you need to do better than the, the, the best person. You know, so ensure that you're always reading, you're always working on yourself. Ensure that you're always ahead. You know, be the best person, right? I've been able to develop my competence in a way that when you talk about disability and technology in Africa, I'm one of the first names that come up, right? And I didn't do anything in disability. I'm now doing my master's in disability. And I didn't do anything technology, but I've been able to read ahead and develop my contents in a way that when you're looking for anybody in this space in Africa, Derek's name will come up. The, third, the fourth thing is magnify your unfair advantage. This is, this is, sometimes people are shy to talk about their achievements. They are shy to talk about where they've come from. They are shy to talk about how much they've done, right? Keep these things in mind. Talk about them because when, in, in times where things become difficult, these are the things that will remind you that this is how far you've come. These are the places you've gone to. You are not that bad. You can actually do better, you know, because sometimes things get really tough. And so you need some of these things to remind you of where you have come from and where you're going. I don't have just one minute. I'm just going to summarize and say that embrace failure as a reminder. Every one of us feels. Just yesterday, I got a, an email from the WHO that I didn't pass in the in the research I applied for. I get so many of these emails, right? People fail, but just let these failures be reminded so that you can do better next time. I hope that this session has been helpful. Um, you can connect with me on LinkedIn and on Instagram, Derek Omari. I'll be happy to speak to you all. Thank you so much. Well, don't go yet. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Uh, thank you so much, Derek, but I want you to stay